Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, this is the uh, 18th annual continuing legal education program of the Bringing Human Rights Home Lawyers Network. Uh, so pretty impressive record, and we're happy to welcome you. Uh, I'm Martha Davis. I'm a professor at Northeastern University School of Law, and I co-direct our program on human rights in the global economy, uh, which we call FERGE, P-H-R-G-E. Um, and Fergie is serving as coordinator of the Bringing Human Rights Home Lawyers Network. Um, to begin this event, we acknowledge uh, uh, the territory on which Northeastern University stands, which is the land of the Wampanoag and the Massachusetts people. Um, today, Boston is still home to many indigenous peoples, including the Mashpi Wampanoag and the Wampanoag tribe of Gay Head, Aquina, the Mi'kmaq, and many more in our region. Uh, others online today, I'm sure you're from uh, all over uh, in different territories, and we invite you to offer your own land acknowledgments uh, in the chat or just say it to yourself um, uh, uh, where you're in the space that you occupy. So um, the Bringing Human Rights Home Lawyers Network is a vibrant group of hundreds, literally hundreds of legal advocates who are working in coalition with grassroots act activists to quote, bring human rights home by using human rights frames to inform domestic advocacy and to engage with international bodies to hold the United States accountable to its human rights obligations. A number of the network's members uh, and member groups are serving as co-sponsors of this program. And I wanna particularly acknowledge their support. Uh, and I'll just run through them here. Um, the American Civil Liberties Union Human Rights Program, American University International Human Rights Law Clinic, the Center on Constitutional Rights, Columbia Law School Human Rights Institute, CUNY International Human Rights and Gender Justice Clinic, the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, the Promise Institute for Human Rights at UCLA, the University of Pennsylvania Law School Transnational Legal Clinic, and the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee. So we especially thank all of those groups for their uh, help in publicizing uh, this program in particular and, for, and thinking through uh, what the format would be. Uh, today's webinar will examine how the growing recognition of an international human right to a safe, clean, healthy, and sustainable environment can support environmental justice and rights advocacy here at home. Before we launch into the substance, though, I have a few housekeeping issues related to the continuing legal education aspect of the program. And those of you that regularly attend CLEs will, um, you know, know the know the uh, the, um, uh, the 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 script here. So um, uh, those of you who are seeking CLE credit in California or New York or both should have received an email from Jenny Wakefield yesterday with the necessary documents. If you registered in the last 24 hours and are seeking credit for California or New York or both, please send a direct message to Jenny Wakefield right now. She's on, online here so that she can send you the materials that you need. The State Bar of California has approved this activity for 3.25 CLE hours, um, credit hours. If you're seeking CLE credit in California, please email Jenny Wakefield your California bar number at the end of, at the conclusion of this program, and we will verify your attendance with the Zoom participants list. We'll then issue a certificate of attendance for your records. We'd also appreciate it if you can complete and return the activity evaluation form at your earliest convenience. Our application for New York accreditation uh, of this program is currently pending. We're hoping to hear from them soon um, and have no reason to think that it won't be granted. Uh, if you are seeking CLE credit in New York, we are going to independently verify your attendance through the use of course codes. Throughout this program, uh, codes will be announced periodically that you are responsible for recording on the attorney affirmation form. Please return the completed attorney affirmation form via email to Jenny Wakefield by next Tuesday, June 14th. Uh, we'd also appreciate it if you could complete and return the evaluation survey. So uh, for those of you who are on from New York, uh, uh, just keep uh, listening for the codes and we'll make sure that we repeat them a couple of times when they come up. If you have any questions regarding CLE credit, uh, Jenny's email can be found in the chat uh, and I think she'll put it up uh, right here now. Um, Okay, uh, so let me now turn to uh, more substantive matters and give a quick overview of today's program. 
On October 8th, 2021, the UN Human Rights Council adopted Resolution 4813, recognizing that a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment is a human right. This right includes the right to breathe clean air, to have access to safe and clean drinking water and sanitation, to a non-toxic environment in which to live and to healthy and sustainable food. Like other human rights, it also incorporates the right to participation in, in policy formation and implementation and access to justice to enforce the right. So this right was a long time coming. Uh, as many have recognized the right to a healthy environment and the responsibility to sustain it is part of many indigenous customary legal systems. In the UN system, the right was recognized as early as 1972 in the Stockholm Declaration as part of the UN's first conference on the human environment. The right has since been recognized by over 150 countries worldwide. Many of them have incorporated the right to a healthy environment into their national constitutions and local laws. And the work to establish this right is not done. As we'll hear from speakers today, nego negotiations are underway for the right to be put before the UN General Assembly. The last step in completing recognition of the right to a healthy environment is a formal international human right. But the world has not stood still uh, in the 50 years since the UN Stockholm Declaration was concluded. It's no longer, if it ever was, plausible to deny the impacts of climate change with changing shorelines and extreme weather events regularly impacting communities and causing dislocations, unnecessary deaths uh, with dire projections, not predictions, projections of more to come. As the urgency for action increases, we've seen an increase in climate litigation worldwide. By some counts, more than 2,000 cases have been filed. Human rights-related litigation is a subset of these legal challenges. We've also seen advocacy before UN bodies raising environmental human rights issues, particularly relating to children. Still, to date, the United States has been singularly resistant to accountability for any human rights implementation, uh, much less accountability for the emerging human right to the environment. So the question on the table for the speakers today is, what do these international developments in the area of, human right, of the human right to a healthy environment, <clears throat> excuse me, mean for the United States, particularly for US activists, uh, for advocates, US advocates, and for US law itself, including state level law, when there have been some um, significant developments? And are there opportunities to draw from and build on human rights developments in addressing environmental justice issues in the United States? Are there opportunities to productively look to international human rights developments as state constitutions expand to include environmental rights through green amendments or reinterpretations of existing environmental provisions? And some of the folks today will uh, are experts who can speak to that. Does human rights framing contribute to empowering domestic social movements with real impacts on policy? We'll be hearing from experts on two panels. Uh, the first panel will focus on environmental justice and the second focusing on intergenerational obligations and children's rights. Uh, at the end of the keynote and after each panel, we'll have time for questions and discussion and we'll ask folks to use the chat function to raise their questions and comments. And I see that folks are already uh, putting different things in the chat. So uh, when the time comes, uh, please feel free to put questions for panelists in the chat and we'll be fielding those and uh, directing them to the appropriate uh, speakers. Okay, so I'm thrilled to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Dominique Day. Uh, Dominique Day is a racial justice accelerator for organizations, institutions, individuals, and communities. She leads an organization uh, called Daylight, uh, which is a, an access to justice platform that uses training, research, mapping, and advocacy as tools to help organizations, communities, and individuals build intersectional racial justice globally. And Dominique Day is the, I think still the chair, but at least a member, uh, if, if not still the chair of the UN Working Group of Experts on People of African Descent, which is a fact-finding body mandated by the UN Human Rights Council to investigate and report on the situation of people of African descent globally. Under uh, Dominique Day's leadership, the working group has been a leader in investigating and exposing the disparate impacts of climate change on people of African descent. 
Um, so Dominic, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I know you've been traveling recently, so um, uh, lucky we are, we're doing this on Zoom so you don't have to go anyplace else to do it. Um, and I'll turn it over to you and then I'll come back uh, when you're done to moderate the Q&A. Thanks. Great, thank you, Martha. And I wanna, I wanna thank you for uh, including me in this important event. I'm joining you from Nova Scotia, uh, where I'm here for UNESCO's annual meeting on the Roots of the Enslaved Persons Project. And it's a good moment to talk about this collision between the conversations we've been having around race and racial justice, around the systemic barriers that have created not just inequalities and injustices and individual actively feeding and contributing to the environmental uh, racism and climate crisis for communities of African descent and for all of us, um, but also to talk about the teaching state there. Um, I want to share with you, I think, in this time that we have a, a frame, right, a different articulation, a way to look at the space that we're all grappling with right now around, around climate and around the environment. A lot of times when I talk about race, uh, which is the principal thing that I do, I talk about the importance of understanding that anti-Black racism, that systemic racism, isn't necessarily tied to or dependent on bias, right? Isn't necessarily tied to or dependent on racial animus and a dislike of people of African descent, but instead requires us to acknowledge how much of our global modern economy, how much of our uh, uh, ongoing transnational systems and local systems were actually built on the idea that the exploitation and um, uh, uh, extraction uh, on the basis of race could be both justified and normalized in communities. We've normalized racial atrocity as a cost of doing business. And in doing so, we've created a set of global expectations, global networks, and global relationships. And today, um, in, in a, a serious global tragedy, right, we're able to see how the injustices of the past, how the injustices and atrocities that have created the, um, the space that I broadly refer to as anti-Black racism, um, injustices that start with the trade of trafficking and enslaved Africans, but actually are embedded in all of the things that were done to normalize that. Today, we're able to see how these injustices of the past have collided with the climate crisis, have collided with um, uh, environmental decision-making that relied on those same norms, that relied on an idea that certain people's lives, certain people's fertility, certain people's intellectual property, their families, their resources, their lands, were ultimately not theirs to choose um, uh, how to direct, that were ultimately subject to uh, exploitation, dispossession, and, and uh, uh, extraction. In this space, if you look through this lens, a lens that's not actually talked about much in the environmental space, in the environmental justice spaces, we can see that the climate crisis has had an immense and disproportionate impact on people of African descent and the ties here to historical and structural racism. Um, some of this is very obvious and direct, right? We can say that people of African descent were historically forced to live in areas vulnerable to environmental degradation, the siting of toxic facilities, the siting of undesirable um, um, uh, spaces were often pushed into communities that had less political and socioeconomic power. Um, and we've seen the rights to a clean, safe, healthy, and sustainable environment was often not fulfilled first and foremost in communities of African descent and other communities of people who were considered to be marginalized. As a result, we've seen this negative impact of climate change was disproportionately borne by people often living in the least protected, the least well-protected situations. However, it's important to actually center race analysis. It's important to center our historical and structural imperatives around race in order to recognize the true scope of the climate crisis um, for, for other reasons as well, right? We understand that we've normalized exploitation and disregard. We've normalized this idea that, um, you know, we actually use this word in, in business, exploiting profit opportunities. We've normalized this idea that opening opportunities to generate profit can come 
acceptably at the expense of people's lives, resources, and lands. And in fact, we see this imperative operating around the world. We see this imperative operating in parallel to and in disregard of climate uh, uh, emergencies and climate red flags all over the world. And we see it operating in parallel to and in disregard of um, environmental justice work, which has actually reached the highest levels of uh, national and intergovernmental conversations without necessarily disrupting business practices and policy practices that perpetuate not just the disregard on the basis of race, but the, co the co this constant politics of extraction and exploitation. So in the time that I have, I'd like to share a few examples of this. This is something our working group has looked into uh, in a session that we held last year. Uh, at the time I was chair, as Martha has uh, noted, I've just transitioned my chair uh, uh, position to the new chair uh, at our public session that we held last week on children of African descent. Um, but I do remain a member of the working group. Um, for us, uh, we've seen some really interesting uh, uh, negotiations of how uh, climate can be disregarded in black and brown communities. One of the most interesting of these is, is found in a well-known documentary on Mossville. Uh, this is a space where a company called Sassol, a South African company, that a petrochemical company that had arisen in response to apartheid uh, sanctions in South Africa, the divestment and sanctions of the international community had put South Africa into an energy crisis. Uh, and Sassol was a company that came up and started looking at and developing energy solutions using petrochemical interventions that were highly toxic to the, to the spaces all around. It was cited near townships in South Africa, where um, the people in those communities, even today, um, continue to face ongoing health, fertility, uh, and reproductive and other um, uh, 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 impact, um, um, tragically so in many spaces, directly as a result of this company. In addition, you've seen this, this massive um, uh, clear cutting and dispossession of land, right? Um, spaces where people should have been able to grow and build communities instead are toxic waste dumps. So Sassel had operated in South Africa. And in fact, South Africans had been quite vocal about its impact, about um, its threat to their lives and health, about the ongoing effect it was having on communities. And yet in the United States, when Sassol decided to become transnational to expand its services, where did it go? It went to Louisiana. It went to Louisiana. It went right by Mossville, a Black community in Louisiana. Now, I know you're going to hear today from Sharon Levine, uh, whom I have um, really endless respect for, about Death Alley, the stretch uh, of the Mississippi between um, uh, New Orleans and Baton Rouge uh, that is home to cancer clusters and human tragedy of unimaginable proportions that is highly racialized. And, and Mossville is a story in that, in that conversation, despite what we knew about Sassel, despite its open and notorious actions in South Africa, um, the governor of Louisiana at the time, Bobby Jindal, welcomed Sassel into Louisiana, offered it a platform um, uh, adjacent to and eventually inside a community of formerly enslaved people who had come together after abolition and after the Civil War to create a community of joy, resistance, and freedom, a community that is now a population of one that has been decimated um, through the um, toxic dumping, the unethical business practices, and the complicity of the state in not just failing to oversee, but also facilitating this company's dispossession of people on that land. Um, uh, Mossville is a space where um, there were no lessons learned from the realities of how Sassel operated in South Africa. And in fact, Sassel openly in the media said it would operate exactly, precisely as it had in South Africa when it came to Louisiana. And yet that was not taken as a warning, but instead as a boon, as a benefit to the state, which presumably saw economic uh, resources flowing to it in this process, and, and, um, and likely was very swayed by this idea that the jobs would also be brought in. So the sacrifice of an entire community, the sacrifice of people, their fertility, their health, 
um, in service to this uh, constant conversation about jobs and economics wasn't a sacrifice borne by communities with resources. It was a sacrifice borne by a Black community that was, by Black communities that were um, already struggling, already ignored, already disregarded. And yet um, the ongoing red flags that were, that were apparent from South Africa, that were apparent from environmental impact statements were wholly disregarded. So, you know, there's a question we have to ask in this regard, right? We have to ask ourselves, well, if we knew Right? If we knew how this company acted in South Africa, if we knew that um, the exploitation of the land and the resources would inevitably impact people, um, and the people there uh, have, su have suffered every reproductive and health consequence you can think of, if we knew this ahead of time, and yet went ahead and opened the doors to Sassol, what does that actually mean in terms of what our priorities are? If we knew ahead of time, that we would decimate a community and create a toxic waste dump out of people's homes and people's lives. What does that actually mean um, in terms of how we see our responsibilities as politicians, as elected officials, as people entrusted with the guardianship, with the custody of the safety of our lives, right? Who is the government responsive to? And this is a space where we have to say, it may be that these systems are operating as designed because the wholesale disregard of the foreseeable consequences um, was not mitigated in any way by the vast amount of information that was available at the time. And in fact, if anything, that information was disregarded and pushed down. Now, Moscow and Sassel are not the only examples of this, right? Um, if you look at Flint, Michigan, right, we see a decision, a determination to shift a water authority that um, had ongoing and has ongoing impact to people there that is devastating. We've seen long-term impact to children from um, uh, being poisoned from the very water that is supposed to protect them that have not been addressed or restored in any real way. We've seen um, the Michigan Water Authority, right? We've seen, uh, we've seen the state of Michigan uh, attempt to commodify its water utility to make it attractive to potential private investors to privatize that space by denying reforms, by cutting off people's water in Detroit, by pushing people out of the system to make it look smaller, more compact, and more attractive to investors. Again, are these systems operating contrary to or consistent with their design? When elected officials and politicians are operating not with uh, the interests of the people in mind, but instead with the interests of a series of um, sorry, I'm getting chat boxes, a series of uh, uh, economic and financial interests that don't serve many of the people in that community. Now, this is a space that we have to talk, that we have to openly connect to climate, right? It's a space that we have to openly connect to um, uh, an international idea that it is the role and it is the appropriate promise of business, of policy to extract. Um, in Africa, we see only a small share of CO2 commit, uh, emissions come from that continent, yet it is a continent most vulnerable to climate change. And we've seen natural disasters linked to climate change. And we've seen ongoing environmental racism. The idea that the environmental impact of what's done in those spaces uh, is irrelevant if profit is at, is, at, is at its core. And we see how linked that is to colonialism, how linked that is to a sense of ownership over someone else's land, someone else's lives, someone else's resources. We've seen in the post-colonial period, how former colonies were used as dumping grounds for the North and for the trade in harmful and toxic products. And we've seen African countries used as waste deposits in the same way we see Black communities in the US used as waste deposits. Um, and the impact is disproportionate from these environmental crises for this matter. Um, development financing and development processes, which assume and promote and, and fund development solutions that create some of the same environmental crises we're looking at in the global north, are also not just increasing the debt burden, burden of African countries, but increasing their vulnerability and instability. 
multinational spaces are actually evading, multinational companies are evading their environmental responsibilities. Indigenous and marginalized people are losing land. And we haven't seen state oversight that's been really um, responsive to this. At the same time, this isn't limited to the continent and this isn't limited to the United States. Ecuador, um, I wanna run through a few different examples to show we can really link this along a through line of race and a through line of extraction and dispossession. In Ecuador, we saw um, the territories of Afro-Ecuadorian people exploited for gold mines, palm oil, the timber industry, and 90% of the country's rivers were um, contaminated uh, as, a, as a result of this. Afro-Ecuadorian communities brought the cases to court for violations of collective territorial rights, but were denied restitution. Uh, community defenders were criminalized, and we have an ongoing conversation about the threats to the life of human rights defenders, including environmental human rights defenders in Central America that is ongoing. In this space, the absence of oversight by the state had allowed pillaging of the land and the lack of protection of rights, including environmental rights, is an added manifestation of environmental racism. This is a space where you see um, a particular uh, approach by multinational corporations is actually being uplifted, supported, and not impeded in any way by a lack of oversight by the state. And our working group has seen this in country visit after country visit, where the open door policy to welcome transnational corporations the jobs, money, and power they bring may uh, frequently operate at a direct expense to people of African descent in those spaces. Even if a lot of environmental justice don't see race and racism in the work that they're doing, it actually does offer a very interesting entry point to understand exactly where our climate problems, our environmental problems are originating from, because the communities that are first devastated are the communities that have always been seen as available and disposable, all the way back to the trade and trafficking and, and enslaved Africans. In this space, right, in Ecuador, we see the benefits of the extractive industries are going directly to foreign actors, but the harm is being endured by a local population of people of African descent. This isn't new, but at, a, at some point, the clear cutting of forests, the denuding of, uh, of the denuding of country of natural resources has actually created a global problem, um, a, a problem that can no longer be ignored by a global community that has actually long ignored the problem when it felt as though it was confined to people of African descent in a particular country, to a, to a reliably marginalized, a reliably disempowered, a reliably ignored, a reliably exploited population in one country. And we see this in country after country. Um, in Ecuador, even when judges, a judge ordered precautionary measures, ordered um, upfront proactive attempts to actually mitigate the harm, it was fully ignored. And that, and that judicial ruling was never, um, was never actually enforced. So um, maybe I have time to go through maybe a couple more and I'll leave some time for questions. Um, you know, Honduras is another great example, right? Uh, the Garafuna, uh, Honduran people of African descent live in the most affected coastal regions of the country. And in this space as well, the national production model that sought to enhance both development and economic benefits using agriculture saw the country as a monoculture, uh, a monocultural agricultural society. And this, this operated to the, to the detriment of local people. Huge plantations of African palm replaced food crops. Traditional methods of food production were lost as hectares after hectares were replaced by these monocultures. And decision makers throughout failed to acknowledge the true effects of this disregard to learn from diverse communities or experiences or even to learn from the reality in the global north that this monoculture approach ultimately stripped the land and left it vulnerable, not just to um, uh, uh, an inability to grow for the local people, but also to environmental and climate impacts. Um, what the Garifuna will tell us, right, is that the climate crisis requires a re-examination of existing production and consumption models, given this disproportionate cost-benefit ratio that um, inures to the benefit of industrial mega projects and their impacts. Um, I'm not going to talk about Death Alley in Louisiana. I'll leave that to Ms. Levine. Um, but 
but maybe we have time for a word on Brazil and a word on Colombia. Um, uh, in Brazil, we've seen the military base hydroelectric products, including a dam, were planned on Quilombo, uh, Quilombo land. The Quilombola people are uh, Afro-Brazilians who uh, 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 live in the Amazon region, and 70% of people living in the Amazon in Brazil are Black. And this, these communities had actually played a vital role in preserving ecosystems and lives. Even at the same time, they're experiencing an increasing threat to their lands, the murder of uh, several uh, leaders and the pillaging of national resources, including uh, natural resources, including during the pandemic. Indigenous, Quilombo, traditional and rural communities were protecting biodiversity on the front lines and trying to actually navigate and negotiate to prevent uh, agribusiness from destroying the um, countryside and, and, and trying to preserve this land of their ancestors. And yet these communities are vulnerable socioeconomically, ongoing, in ongoing ways subject to environmental racism. And this is overlaid over other manifestations of racism and systemic racism against people of African descent in Brazil. They had faced surging violence during COVID-19 from police and state authorities. And the state again had turned a blind eye to their experiences even when asked for help. Uh, Afro-descendants in Colombia, like other parts of the world, had um, suffered in these same ways. We have ancestral ter ter territories, natural resources, water, forests of Afro-descendant Afro communities were being plundered by transnational corporations and by the state. The Constitutional Court of Colombia had ruled that state authorities were responsible for these violations to life, health, water, food uh, rights. Um, and the right to a healthy environment. And the court had actually ruled in their favor. And yet again, we haven't seen adequate enforcement of this judicial intervention. Um, this idea that we can just ignore judicial rulings um, is a transnational one. And it's a transnational one that has specific um, uh, support and leadership in some practices here in the US and elsewhere. So, so what is this about, right? Uh, wh what does this create? Um, because for us in the US, I, uh, also I am an American, but for us in the US, we are not only experiencing this in our own country in highly racialized ways where the US South is often treated like the global South, where we see a massive environmental degradation, the impacts of the climate crisis and the impacts of environmental racism are uh, hugely concentrated in black communities, but not just in black communities are hugely concentrated in spaces that have traditionally been um, exploited, but now starting to have impacts that are much broader and foreseeably going to impact, uh, have impact in very universal ways. You know, what does this mean? And I'm going to uplift uh, the words of Colette Pichon Battle, who um, is very much a leader and a hero in this space. And in our session, um, spoke to us about the red, black, and green New Deal. Of course, she runs the Gulf Coast Law and Policy Center and is um, one of the most important voices in the US about what it looks like to meaningfully confront the climate crisis and environmental racism for people of African descent and for people in the South, and particularly obviously focused on the Gulf Coast. And the red, black, and green New Deal is one of the renegotiations of what it means to show up for communities, what it means to show up around the environment, what it means to show up around our ongoing obligations to each other. Um, and this civil society intervention um, talked about what it looks like to center voices of African descent. And again, not so much around the idea that um, we should all love Black people, although uh, as Cornell West has said, if we could all find love, rather than disdain for Black people, it would actually shift mindsets and shift policies. I would encourage you all uh, to read Professor West or to, or to watch some of his speeches uh, in that regard. But it says that, you know, the Red, Green, and Black New Deal talks about this idea that if we can center voices of African descent that are seeing the current ongoing and um, really devastating tragic personal and community impacts uh, uh, it might actually help us to acknowledge that climate, climate and environmental impact is particularly pervasive in the global South, but as importantly that these are byproducts, right? These are byproducts of systems, of economic, uh, economic systems that have actually uh, uh, been generated through the 
through the theft, the trade and the trafficking of bodies like mine, right? That we start with this idea of how a global modern economy can look as we start trafficking bodies like mine from Africa to the Americas in a triangular trade that brought unbelievable amounts of wealth, unbelievable amounts of profit and unbelievable opportunities to people in Europe, the Americas and Africa. And yet, um, what we see today in the environment, what we see today with respect to the climate is a byproduct of an economic system, of economic systems of extraction, exploitation, um, accumulation through dispossession and white supremacy. And what this means is that the climate change is not an isolated crisis. It means that racism is not an isolated or a personal or an individual um, uh, activity. But these are symptoms of an economic system that jeopardizes Black lives, that ultimately jeopardizes all lives. This is sort of connected to this idea that we talk about a lot in the US right now, that when Black lives matter, all lives will matter. When we look at economic systems that are really grounded in extraction, dispossession, and white supremacy, the threat to Black lives is merely um, the canary in the coal mine. And a lot of us understand that at this point, um, and, and what that might entail. So what are the next steps here, right? We have this idea that um, we need to define preparedness a lot more broadly. It's not really about stocking up the water, but um, it is about investing in communities and providing information in black and brown communities that have been largely ignored um, through, from hurricane season to hurricane season. It involves moving, and again, I'm uplifting the words of, of Colette Bichon Battle here. It involves moving infrastructure to renewable energy sources, namely sources that are available in the aftermath of a climate disaster. It requires, preparedness requires a conversation about climate crisis and climate disaster and the solutions in order to adapt um, to both imminent events and to mitigate impact of human exploitation and extractivism that so often becomes a characteristic of how we navigate these very difficult times. Um, maybe the example of this could look at um, how heavily we relied on Black labor, on home health aids, and all of this during COVID um, to facilitate the quarantine of people who had the resources. Um, and then we also need to acknowledge the reality of the context, right? What the lack of investment has already cost us. We have sewage and water deficiencies in the, in the South. We have ongoing lack of investment that has communities living as though they're in wholly undeveloped countries. Um, it's very surprising to see this in the United States, right? Um, and so this idea even before climate disaster has become a norm as it is right now, was that these communities were already vulnerable at risk and already disregarded by policymakers. In part, um, you know, this space is, is a hard conversation to have because the principles of repair and reparations, the principles of equity, um, the conf complex conversations about what has driven a current reality where bodies like mine are seen as labor rather than leaders. That complex conversation is uncomfortable for some. It's uncomfortable for those who benefited from privileges that may be unearned. It's uncomfortable for those who would have to confront the complicity of their family or their family name in the extraction, the accumulation, and the exploitation. But without confronting that discomfort, we can't actually disrupt the systems that continue to create climate disaster, that continue to threaten us all. Um, although we've tried, right? We've ignored the problem. We assume that there will be innovative solutions somewhere on the horizon. We tried to purchase carbon credits as though that does more than just shift a, situ shift a conversation to later on. In these spaces, we see over and over that the thing we actually need to confront which is an entire mindset of extraction that has always seen those of us who are brown as, um, as wholly exploitable is actually going to cost everybody far more um, than it has thus far in the imminent future. And so what it means to be prepared, what it means to repair and create new opportunities and what it means to go up around the environment um, contrary to many environmental justice conversations that have happened that thus far, what it means to show up around the environment is actually showing up for communities, showing up for people, showing up for um, a renegotiation of mindset. 
that have allowed people of African descent to be exploited, but as importantly, have allowed an entire mindset of extraction to poison our entire world. So in this regard, I, um, I really welcome the conversation that's happening here today. I have so much respect for many of the people who will be um, speaking later on, and I'm looking forward to listening. Um, and in this space where we already see the global realities um, and, and we already see the legacies of uh, colonial mindsets and the trade and trafficking of enslaved Africans, perhaps it is, we are long overdue to start a conversation about how race and racism and the systems we have created with the social construct of race will require an explicit negotiation, an explicit no negotiation with our, um, our connection to, our benefit from, our ongoing investment in systemic racism if we actually want to show up meaningfully for the environment and for the climate. Thank you. Well, Dominic, thank you so much for that um, really a wonderful introduction to today. I mean, you have such an overview from your work with the UN. It's really valuable to, to hear uh, about these, um, you know, to give us this kind of uh, broad um, kind of beginning uh, for this conversation. So I really appreciate it. We have a lot of questions in the chat here that I, I don't think we'll be able to get to all of them. But one thing I just remembered, I need to give out a code for the um, New York CLE. So let me do that first. Um, here's the code. It's PJQR31. PJQR31. I'll say it one more time. PJQR31. Okay, thank you. So Donald Dominique, we can get back to some questions here. Um, the, the first question, uh, I'll sort of paraphrase. I think it's, I think, uh, it's, it's asking really, is there a qualitative difference between um, uh, the, the impacts on poor, community, poor communities based on poverty as opposed to communities, impoverished areas that are primarily black and brown? You know, is there, is there something different when there's a racial component, I guess, and, and we're thinking about impacts of climate change? Yeah, no, I think it's a great question. And, and this is all always the question, right? Is this about class or is it about race? And I think we have a lot of really powerful evidence that this is about race, right? You see that the political power and the political acumen of poor communities um, a, are seen very differently by policymakers, people in power, and B, they're, they're um, uh, well, well, let me roll that back. If you go to a poor community in Belgium, you don't see uh, what we saw in Black communities in Belgium, which is the, the ongoing dispossession of people, the extraction of people, the downgrading of their labor, the downgrading of their educations, the exploitation that is sort of like very systemic. If you look at the poverty in Eastern Europe versus the economic situation in Africa, we see exploitation happening in Africa. We see environmental exploitation happening in the Caribbean islands that we don't see happening in Europe. And in fact, the poverty of Eastern Europe is actually being leveraged in all sorts of ways. Uh, right now, we see um, uh, uh, UNICEF apparently is moving its, its uh, services to Europe. We see Hungary has been a big expansion of where UNHCR and other UN agencies uh, have cited their headquarters. Uh, the uh, uh, open society as well, right? So in some spaces, in these poor, poorer white spaces, you're seeing um, economic opportunity that's coming in to actually bring uh, jobs, to bring opportunity without actually exploiting the people who are local, um, using, giving them fair wages, giving them uh, jobs and opportunities that aren't going to strip them of environmental um, uh, rights, um, in fact, actually contribute to their rights. What we've seen in the development conversation, what we've seen in environmental conversation on the continent, in the Caribbean, in the global south generally, it could, continues to be an extractivist conversation. It's not a conversation you're seeing, for example, in North Dakota or right, like places in like white America where we see a tremendous amount of economic scarcity. We don't see this ongoing mindset of accumulation, dispossession and extraction as evidently and as directly as we're able to measure it in black communities. I don't know if that's a great answer, but uh, the, 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 abs the, the short answer is it's not the same race and class, um, not equivalent in terms of how 
we benefit that or how, how we burden that and, and our mindset has something to do with it. Great, thank you. So um, I'll just uh, recommend that people take a look at the chat. We have a couple of um, posts here that aren't really questions for Dominique, but are, are questions for the group. Um, one from Diane Post and um, I think another one down here about the Inter-American Court. So please uh, feel free to respond uh, you know, individually to people about those things. Let me turn to this question from Rob Robinson, who you might know, um, Dominique, who uh, he asks, um, how do we raise awareness of in the US of the transnational transgressions. And he says, um, you know, financial interests have taken over housing globally, that there, there's been in, in many other places, some um, uh, real outcry in response, and he particularly cites Brazil. Um, but he says, as an organizer, I feel here in the US that we just accept um, these, uh, you know, the commodification of some of these um, basic human rights um, yeah. and then the, the, the racial consequences. So yeah. um, what's the, do you have any ideas about how we can uh, respond to that? Yeah, I don't have solutions, but I definitely have solidarity. Like I can tell you from experience personally and professionally, US courts are not so open to conversations about international human rights in domestic contexts, right? If you go to a judge and um, start bringing in human rights rather than local law, you kind of get laughed out of court. And this has been true. I mean, unless you're actually talking about, you know, the Alien Tort Claims Act or something like this. Um, so, so this is a space where U.S. courts, U.S. policy, the, the discourse of human rights that we're able to use all over the world is anathema in a lot of U.S. spaces that control money. And in fact, this idea of our exceptionalism also is very present inside of civil, civil society organizing in the U.S. This idea of American exceptionalism, we're not like anywhere else. And yet, um, we can see that the social construct of race was always transnational. It was a way to normalize racial atrocity as we were stealing people, mixing them up, not letting them out choose uh, anything about their lives or their families and putting them in to an untenable situation where their own children were yanked out of their hands. And in that space, right, we, we constructed anti-Blackness as a way to um, normalize something uh, around a world where people had different languages, right? The people in Portugal don't always speak, you know, 50% of all enslaved Africans came through the port of Lisbon, but the people, those people didn't speak Portuguese. People in England may not speak Portuguese. People in the US may not speak any of those languages, but the reliable, visible nature of anti-Blackness did not just uh, created this system of exploitation, allowed a very key metric, a very open, visible metric about whose human rights needed to be protected and whose human rights were irrelevant or non-existent because they existed walking through the world as property. And in that regard, our understanding of race has always been transnational and is well enforced country to country in very similar ways. We travel in the world and we see, we hear it's, it's it's really stunning to me how similar the stories I hear are country to country, even in very de different development contexts. I mean, like, so in that regard, we should be having a transnational conversation. And yet, I think we understand that funding mechanisms are not necessarily looking at um, spreading them been across borders. Um, the framings that we use are often ape or, or replicate the framings of American law, which are not looking at race as a transnational thing. And in fact, aren't even looking at racism as systemic, right? Like a lot of, if you're trying to win a racism or discrimination case in the, in the courts, you're looking for a tremendous amount of incredibly overt behavior in order to actually situate a racist conversation in uh, spaces in the United States. And so that space where, you know, when I talk about this in uh, uh, in other spaces, I talk about this as a failure of taxonomy, right? The way that we've defined race, the way that we've classified issues in the law, it's a race issue or it's a gender issue. It's an American issue or an international issue. Our taxonomy has actually erased or suppressed various realities about race and racism that allows them to go unchecked. So even if you catch the person using the racial slurs, even if you catch the overt burdening of someone's rights on the basis of race, our taxonomy itself actually erases the transnational nature of race and some of the more subtle but very discernible ways racism shows up. Great, thank you. Um... For that. So uh, we've got a question here 
um, a little drilling down a little bit more. So it asks, um, can you, can you say a bit more about the linkages between extraction, structural racism, and fertility? And of course, that's on a lot of our minds now um, in the US. Uh, is there analysis, an analysis around these issues using a eugenics or other frame that highlights the targeted promotion of some people's reproduction and restrictions of other people's reproduction? Um, so I don't know if that's uh, something that the working group uh, talked about. Of course, it's, it is uh, related to the environmental um, you know, movement of context. Um, so any thoughts about that? Yeah, no, it's a tough, I don't, I'm not going to tell you we have some analysis that's fully um, directly on point there, but I will say this, um, you know, we understand our biological destiny is our children. We understand that um, uh, the importance of fertility, and we have a multi-billion dollar uh, or multi-million dollar economy in fertility right now. Um, I had the pleasure of living in Palestine for a while, and I lived in East Jerusalem and was very aware of how much tourism and how much access there was to um, fertility technology for people who were often um, uh, coming into that space merely to benefit from the Israeli reproductive technology. At the same time, right, when we put that investment, that availability, the primacy of creating children and giving people this biological destiny, when we put this up against what Sassolo is doing in Louisiana, the fact that um, miscarriages number in in the hundreds, the idea that people's fertility has been permanently impacted in all sorts of measurable ways. And even the sort of very early process, right, where you have people being trafficked here on boats in the Middle Passage and babies ripped from their arms. I'm told that the new, uh, the newly renovated Legacy Museum, I haven't seen this new renovation, I haven't been there at all actually, but the newly renovated Legacy Museum in Montgomery actually uh, confronts this very powerfully um, and presents that image of this uh, deprivation of children as a routinized, normalized, and systemic part of the uh, trade and trafficking in our bodies. And that space, right, where then you see during enslavement, you have children sold away from their parents. We just finished a session last week sure. in New York where we had um, I had the brilliant Dorothy Roberts and uh, who has a new book out called Torn Apart, talking about family policing and how the family regulation system has been provably racialized in the United States where the, the removal of children from black families has been not only normalized, but relies on this idea that black motherhood is somehow less than. That space, right, when you actually compare um, this sort of promotion, lifting up of fertility in certain spaces and white fertility. I'll tell you like, a little personal story. I took a little look at um, the Israeli technology there, uh, thinking perhaps, uh, I'm a lesbian, thinking perhaps I would move forward. Uh, and it was impossible to find a Black donor um, or to bring a Black donor if you weren't, you know, there's a whole religious imperative and Israeli politics that, that goes in there as well. And I was, of course, uh, living in Palestine. But that space, right, um, looks very different when we're talking about white versus black. And we can go back to the trade and trafficking of enslaved Africans and have a consistent set of fertility and family policies that have degraded uh, the black family, that have that have uh, stripped the dignity of black motherhood or erased the viability of black motherhood. Often in favor of really problematic um, uh, choices. You know, the great example of that is Devante Hart and the, those six kids who were uh, uh, driven off a cliff by the adoptive parents um, uh, just a few years ago in California. So we've been able to see when we look at policy relating to black family, a really clear racialized norm that extends all the way back to the trade and trafficking of enslaved Africans that is very different from the narrative we can see when we look in the spaces of socioeconomic privilege where white people with resources can invest am amazing amounts of money in, 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 in having children, right? And, and are supported in that rather than um, deprived of their dignity by the state. Great, thank you. Um, so this will be our, our last question. I'm going to combine a couple here. So we've got a question from Karen saying, what action can we take to start the conversation in our communities? And I'm going to add to that. Uh, you alluded a few times in your talk to sort of, um, uh, you know, maybe opportunities that would have been there for community mobilization if communities across 
national lines have been in better communication or coordination. You're talking about South Africa and Louisiana, for example. And so I'm wondering uh, to get back to the theme of the uh, of the uh, webinar today, the human right to the environment. Is there a role for the human right to the environment in stimulating conversations in the communities or in supporting transnational, cross-national conversations or solidarity uh, around some of these issues? Yeah, I mean, I guess I would say um, both solidarity and civil society are the only hope. We have seen um, with every human right, um, systemic, measurable, obvious burdens on that right that go disregarded by the state. And the only way the state reliably protects people's rights is with the ongoing pressure and um, you know, the social opprobrium of, uh, of civil society action. And so in these spaces, right, I don't know that, I don't know if a community organizing would have really changed with Sasol. I actually think there was an intention to do it and there was a disregard of unities. Um, but I do think that what we've seen in the U.S. and outside the U.S. is that the state has a clear role to protect its citizens, and it's clearly abrogated when it comes to transnational corporations. And so, I mean, I do actually, you know, we have some recommendations in our report. Um, I'm hoping some, and, you know, I, I feel like the recommendations are not as strong as they should be, just secretly between you and me. But um, I do think this ongoing awareness and pressure when multinationals corporations specifically are coming in, the um, talking to people about what that looks like and really uplifting these outrages as broadly as we can. We've seen really great uh, civil society um, uh, uh, use of social media makes a difference. Maybe one example more, I know we're, we're short on time, is um, in Peru. I did a country visit in Peru last March and we spoke to a bunch of uh, sharecroppers who had been, not last March, March of, March of 2020, sorry. We spoke to a bunch of sharecroppers who had been um, uh, working for a transnational corporation that literally bust them to work in the uh, to the company to the lands in the morning at 3 a.m. Return them at 9 p.m. Their entire life was just going and farming and, and and sharecropping here. They were forced to sign unconscionable contracts where the lands they rented were rented in U.S. dollars, but their yields were compensated in Peruvian currency, right? So this imbalance and this unconscionable contracting, which they didn't have the power, even when they came together and they, they drove hours to see us on a Saturday morning, they didn't have the power to redress that imbalance because even in solidarity with each other, there's not a single person in that group that can talk about this as an unconscionable contract. And of course they don't have the luxury of saying, we're gonna walk off the job in this space, right? And, and yet the state, which has oversight of the transnational corporation absolutely had the power to step in and say contracting with our citizens shall not be unconscionable, shall not uh, involve currency disparities. And, and that's the real issue, right? When you see the state getting involved, they say it should be fair. We should not discriminate. But these discriminations, these unfairnesses and injustice happen in very specific ways. And the expertise for that is inside the communities themselves. And so there's no way to do this work to talk about justice without talking to people, listening to their experience, and then uplifting these specific, um, these specific examples of outrage and injustice into the conversation about what state protection looks like. And what that means, it's not a one-off conversation. It's an ongoing conversation about how racism, how injustice, how exploitation has transformed even as we close whatever doors we can find. It's like you put your finger in the dam. If in fact the company is looking to scrape a few dollars everywhere you go, you have to actually keep uplifting the current manifestation of these problematic policies until we dramatically revise these systems. But that conversation requires access and involvement with a group of people who may be hard to reach. And it involves an ongoing pressure to the policymaker and to the company about what they're doing. I think there's lots of opportunity, but this broad language that we like to use in the UN, that we like to use in human rights spaces is you know, almost useless in terms of actually creating real change or real assistance on the ground. Well, thank you. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, so Dominique, thank you so much for this, uh, um, setting us off on a, on a uh, what we hope will be a fruitful conversation for the next couple of hours and really appreciate your time. There are 
lots of other, um, there are lots of praise for you in the chat, as well as some other comments, um, some specific, uh, you know, sort of legal um, analyses and so on. So feel free to scroll through that, um, you know, when you're, uh, when we're listening to the next panel. And um, uh, we're going to now say, um, Dominique, you can recede into the background. And <laughs> I really appreciate, again, your, your Thank comments. Thank you so much. Thank it's been so a pleasure to be here. And I'll okay. stick around with you. Thank you. Bye-bye. So, um, so uh, thanks everyone for for uh, putting the questions in the chat. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them, but uh, hopefully we'll you know just continue to have the conversation going there during the next panel. And so I'm going to now um, turn to our opening panel uh, titled "Implementing Environmental Justice." And as you know, um, you know as we've just heard, environmental justice has provided a domestic civil rights informed framework for analyzing. Uh, racial disparities in environmental policies for some time. Uh, the question on the table today is whether the emergence of the human right to a healthy environment adds anything to this work. And to lead us through this discussion, we're excited to have Rachel Gore Freed. Uh, Rachel is a uh, human rights lawyer, community organizer, and there she is, uh, and social justice advocate and educator with a wealth of domestic and international experience. As the um, uh, Unitarian Universalist so, uh, Service Committee's Vice President and Lead Program Officer, Rachel leads the organization's creative and effective approaches to advancing human rights. Prior to joining UUSC, Freed was, uh, Rachel Freed was deeply engaged in community struggles around the world, including, just to pick one out that's relevant to here, successful litigation against Exxon for violations of the Clean Air Act in the Houston Baytown Shipping Channel. So Rachel, thank you so much. And I'll turn the floor over to you to um, uh, launch the, the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. And thank you for all the supporters of the Bringing Home um, Human Rights uh, Group and, and for this panel today. Um, and I just wanted to start, thanks Dominique for setting up the context and the greater conversation for us. And I think building off what you said, the themes and our understanding today of colonialism, of capitalism, of extractionism, which leads to racialized violence um, and the way that environmental justice is interwoven in that through the exploitation of land, of resources, of bodies and communities. Um, it's all so woven together that we have to think about strategies as a movement um, and global intersectional strategies for our advocacy that really understand the connection between extractivism, racialized violence, and the dominance of those with power and control of our resources um, for the work that we're doing in the environmental justice field. Um, I, I won't forget the fact that when I was litigating against Exxon, there were two firms, two of Houston's top firms with 20 partners from each firm in the room against three of us all people of color um, and a small nonprofit called the National Environmental Law Center working on behalf of communities um, in the Baytown shipping area. So the power, the dominance, the exploitation, the system, the way the system was designed um, and how that uh, impacts um, all of us is, is very important for us to, to look at in, in context as we think about the strategies to um, to fight it. So this panel will be looking at how um, different uh, frontline community organizations and activists have worked at the grassroots level, um, both to uh, leverage international human rights mechanisms and um, uh, to challenge um, harmful environmental justice policies. And we're going to hear a little bit about um, the work in Louisiana and we'll also be hearing about the newly adopted Green Amendment in New York State. Um, we're gonna, this is gonna be a dialogue. So we have four questions. Each panelist is gonna answer a question. Um, and we're three. And then at the very end, we'll take some questions in the chat. Um, and we will have a little bit of time for a question answer. Um, I wanna quickly introduce our panelists. I'm really privileged to be here with such a great group of activists. Um, we have Kasha Bernard, who's an attorney at the Center for International Environmental Laws Climate and Energy Program. Kasha works primarily on halting petrochemical infrastructure 
build out that threatens global climate and the health of frontline and fenceline communities. Um, she works particularly in the US Gulf um, and Appalachia region. Um, she has a background uh, in international studies um, and a JD from uh, Notre Dame Law, Law School. And she's also worked at um, in Oregon where she worked on climate and communities program in, on a two-year fellowship with the Craig Law Center. I'm also really pleased to uh, share that Katrina Ku is with us. Um, Katrina is the Hope Distinguished Professor of Environmental Law at the Pace University School of Law, where she teaches um, a range of different law classes from admin to climate change to environmental and international environmental law and focuses her scholarship on climate change and sustainability. Um, she's also the co-editor of the Law of Adaptation to Climate Change, um, both looking at US and international aspects of climate change law. Um, before entering academia, um, Professor Ku worked in the environmental litigation practice groups of the Arnold and Porter Law Firm um, and was an advisor on natural resource policy. She has also clerked um, at the District Court for the Southern District of New York and at the US Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. Um, I am extremely pleased to also include um, Anne-Marie Chischilly, and I'm so sorry if I uh, did not get your name right because we chance to check in on that. Was it okay? Um, so she's the vice president of the office for Native American initiatives at the Northern Arizona University. She's served as executive director for the Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals for 11 years, um, works on a number of federal advisory committees, including the Environmental Protection Act, the National Environment Advisory Com Committee as vice chair, and um, the advisory committee for the sustained national climate assessment. Um, which is now the Independent Advisory Committee on the Sustained National Climate Assessment, um, and with the EPA's Safe Drinking Water Council, um, the Department of Interior's Advisory uh, Advisor on Climate Change and Natural Resources um, Sciences. So a tremendous amount of work with um, federal agencies um, where she has brought her tremendous knowledge on topics such as Indian law, environmental law, uh, water law, tribes and indigenous people and traditional knowledge. Um, she has a wealth of community experience as well, working with the Gila River Indian community, where she played a critical role in implementing the Arizona Water Settlement Act and founded the community's renewable energy team. Um, she's also worked with uh, the United Nations um, on advancing indigenous rights and um, is a member of the Navajo Nation, um, the Diné Nation. Um, and last but not least, I want to introduce Cheryl Levine, who we've heard a little bit about earlier today, but Cheryl is a retired special education teacher and lifelong resident of the St. James Parish in Louisiana, which is located along the Mississippi River and has been referred to at times as Cancer Alley. Um, in 2018, she founded Rise um, Street James, a faith-based grassroots organization dedicated to environmental justice in the community. And um, throughout the last few years, she's mobilized her community against the proposed construction of what would be, would have been one of the largest plastic manufacturing plants in the world. Um, Sharon's work uh, doing grassroots campaigning was successful in stopping the construction of the plant. And since then she has been involved in safeguarding the environment and residents around St. James Parish. And for this, she was awarded the prestigious Goldman Environmental Prize. So I know you all, um, this is a, we have a wealth of experience with us today and our, I'm excited to dive into our first question. Um, and we're gonna take turns on who goes first, but I'm going to ask um, Kasha uh, to go first for the first question. Um, and then we'll, we'll cycle through all of our uh, panelists. So the first question um, is, how can human rights norms and constitutional environmental rights be strategically leveraged to support frontline communities in climate justice? And this is a really broad question, um, but I'm excited to hear how you see this uh, in particular. Thanks. Um, thanks for having me. I'm also really excited and honored to be on this panel with y'all. Um, yeah, just being from the Gulf Coast, living in Texas and Louisiana, these communities have been 
home to these environmental harms and disasters for years. The Gulf not only hosts um, these major fossil fuel projects, but it's also overburdened by concurrent extreme weather events like heat and freezes, the flooding, the hurricanes, and the dead zone in the Gulf itself. Um, but the communities on the front line of both the drivers of climate change and the impacts of climate change are human rights holders. Um, in the past year, the recognition of the right to the healthy environment has made it uncontested that climate change is a human rights issue um, to be both recognized by states and non-state actors. Um, I've been working a lot on the Formosa campaign and um, one way that human rights have been leveraged there, the Loyola Law School students wrote a letter to the UN Special Rapporteur on Racism um, about the project. And that led to multiple human rights experts from the UN denouncing racism in Cancer Alley. And subsequently following that, uh, New Orleans passed a resolution opposing Formosa and actually mentioned the condemnation by human rights experts um, of environmental racism in Cancer Alley. So all of these are just examples of how the global recognition of human rights, um, also that climate change and climate justice are these human rights issues and it adds weight and authority to the fact that frontline communities all over the world deserve better. I'm gonna ask uh, Anne-Marie to go next and then we'll go to Katy and then Sharon. Okay, well, thank you and good morning. It's a pleasure to be on this panel with all these incredible women. I come to you from Flagstaff, Arizona, which are sacred to 11 tribes in this region, including my own, the Navajo Nation. So with that uh, land acknowledgement, I'll move into, you know, the question is a very um, interesting and very relevant at this time for tribes. There are 574 federally recognized tribes in the United States right now, and almost half of them are in Alaska. And so when we talk about how we serve them, the institute that I over, used to oversee and still oversee is um, we served over 95% of all those tribes in workforce development for environmental issues. And the key issue rising to the top for all the tribes is climate change. I think we're, we're used to looking at things in silos, air quality, water quality, all the land issues. But then when you look at climate change, you look at them holistically. And one of the issues that we ran, uh, ran straight into was just how do we protect traditional knowledges that are being offered in their adaptation plan and mitigation. And so, and one of the things we work with is all the frontline communities as well. They are, um, especially in Alaska, you're looking at um, impacts that are hitting Alaska 10 times faster than it's hitting any of us in the, any of us in the contiguous United States. And they're, um, their subsistence base, meaning they get 80% of their water, their food from the rivers, lakes, tundra beside them on a daily basis. So when we talk about climate change hitting, it's hitting them at a rapid rate. And so one of the things we're working at I ITEP is we developed a program specifically for climate change, developing their adaptation plans, and really the next step is implementation. So when we're thinking about moving forward with all these different um, frontline groups, um, and there's a lot in Indian country, which trying to strategize by moving through what the National Congress of American Indians, we're looking at high level groups that are coordinating among one another to really voice um, opinions that are coming directly from tribes. Um, I sit on several advisory committees as, as she read, and one of the biggest concerns that have always come to me is, folks would ask me, what do tribes want to do? Um, what, do they, what are they looking for? And so we've developed several documents that address that specifically. One is the status of tribes and climate change. I'll put it in the, in the chat. And it's, um, it's 34, it's 90 different tribal experts from across the country. And it looks in 34 different um, tribal narratives. So it's really looking and asking tribes as sovereign nations, what are you wanting us to do as a federal agency, as a state agency, and how do we, um, uh, interact with you in an appropriate way. And so 34 different tribes offered up their um, strategies, their, what they're doing in the field, what are the issues they're having. And it comes from all across the country, from the top of Barrow, Alaska, all the way to Florida. You know, we're looking at tribes throughout the region. So we're looking at all these different things. And really, for me, it's really emphasizing that tribes need to speak for themselves and bring solutions 
to the forefront through the, by themselves and ask for the solutions to be um, funded in a way that's appropriate with their sovereign status. So those are, those are my opening remarks for that question. Thank you so much, Emory. Go ahead, Katie. Hi, uh, thank you so much for having me. My perspective is a little bit different. I'm gonna focus on subnational environmental constitutionalism. And I'm very interested to hear this group's perspectives on how that might be in dialogue with and kind of mutually reinforce some of what's happening with environmental human rights at the international level. So here in New York in November, we amended our state constitution to enshrine a right to clean air, clean water, and a healthful environment. And what we are deep in the weeds on in New York right now is trying to make sure that litigation of that right gives it teeth and gives it teeth in particular to address environmental justice problems. And so to contemplate the question Rachel asked about how do we imagine constitutional environmental rights can be strategically leveraged to support frontline communities and climate justice. What I want to start with is a little bit of an anecdote. So I was really involved in advocacy to support the adoption of the environmental right in New York, which did have to be voted on by voters. And um, we really understood that one value of the environmental right would be to create a legal tool to challenge an unjust status quo that had created and perpetuated environmental injustice in New York. And so what we would often talk about is provide two examples of areas where we recognize significant gaps in environmental law in New York. One was with respect to emerging drinking water contaminants that were clearly presenting real risks to people who were drinking them but weren't yet regulated under the Safe Drinking Water Act. And a second context was with respect to um, areas where despite having lots and lots of really good environmental laws in New York, we nonetheless have communities that continue to live in places that chronically fail to meet relevant environmental standards. And I think there's been an explosion. It, the, I'm, you know, it's fascinating the way that um, big data and mapping has been able to just surface that fact in a really obvious, um, obvious way. Something that really um, didn't, I guess maybe it didn't really surprise me, but that struck me. Um, is that there was opposition to the, to the adoption of a fundamental environmental right in New York, in part from environmental attorneys who were working at agencies, environmental agencies in New York. And their argument was essentially that um, everybody's working their hardest, everybody's trying their best to implement environmental laws. In doing that, in doing so, they have to make hard choices and those should be choices that expert agencies and the legislature makes as opposed to the courts. And what I'm gonna drop into the chat now, this is actually um, an excerpt from kind of a, a white paper that a, a group put together in New York thinking about the pros and cons of adopting an environmental right in New York at the time. And I remember reading it um, and when I, read it and they talked about um, the current laws are intended to strike a balance that's in the best overall interest of the public. And talking about the fact that our current implementation of environmental law reflects, quote, the intentional results of a comprehensive process. All I could think was, well, what you're saying then is that the intentional results of our comprehensive process is to make sure that low income communities of color in New York continue <laughs> to suffer from asthma continue to be exposed to levels of pollution that exceed standards upon which we've all agreed. And so that to my mind, environmental justice and uh, was a, a really strong rationale for the adoption of environmental right. And to give you a sense of the specific ways that we are hopeful that we will be able to litigate and use and not just litigate, but use the environmental right in New York is first, we think it creates a constitutional floor and that can provide a way to challenge the issue of permits, even if they might be allowed under existing law in areas where there are already a lot of other facilities, i.e. where you're experiencing cumulative impacts and there's chronic non-attainment of relevant environmental standards. We also anticipate and hope that we can embed the existence of that environmental right into the culture and decision-making of local government actors and zoning decisions they're making and agency officials when they're deciding what limits to put in permits and whether and to whom to grant permits and when, that they always have to be mindful 
of whether and how their decisions will protect every individual New Yorker's fundamental right to a healthful uh, environment. We're also optimistic in the context of climate change. New York just passed a really wonderful climate change law and everyone's celebrating. And all I can think is, hey guys, that was the easy part. <laughs> now we have to actually have the political will to implement it in a meaningful way. I'm hopeful that the existence of the environmental right can prevent climate, black, uh, climate backsliding, i.e. backing away from some of the commitments um, that we've made. So at least you know, that's what we're hoping. There's a long road to go. We have to get court rulings that the right is self-executing. We have to get court rulings that recognize a cause of action, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm very optimistic that we can do it. And I do think it will provide significant, a, a really powerful, both legal and cultural and rhetorical tool in New York if we do it right. And maybe we can learn from the international context. Thank you so much. That was helpful to go zoom really into what's going on in New York. Um, I'm going to ask Sharon now to provide your perspective and it would be really uh, interesting to hear sort of comparatively how, what this has looked like in Louisiana. Well, first of all, I'm glad to be here and thank you all for inviting me to be on this panel. I just would like to share some of the experiences that I'm having in Louisiana. Uh, our legislature, they pass laws where industry has more say so than the people in the community. I feel like we are left out in decision making and uh, they pass laws when we don't even realize the laws are being changed and the laws are mostly to protect industry and not to protect the, the community. And we experience that a lot in our state and especially in our parish, our local officials, they do things without consulting the citizens. They, they vote on issues. They vote on these permits, DEQ approved perm permits that uh, give industry the power to pollute as they want and they are not being held accountable. And we think that they, these laws, need, they, they need to be enforced better than what they're doing. And, we were, we in St. James, we call DEQ and report emissions that's being released into the air. And they come out weeks later after the report is done. And just, just recently we had DEQ to come to St. James in the fifth district and to monitor the air because we have been calling, especially me, I've been calling a long time to report things that I see that's going on. And uh, they came to they came for, for two days to park in the fifth district where I'm from, but they didn't let anyone. I mean, they didn't, they didn't let us know the results of their um, of them of them collecting the data, because we have been giving them data for quite some time now for years, and it seems like they they they, they wasn't listening to us, but we as a frontline community we've been we've been trying to save our community we've been trying to uh we we have attorneys that filed the clean air act uh against formosa and against south 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 louisiana methanol that's trying to come into our into our community also and we and we, we filed the clean water act because they um they dump chemicals into our, into our drinking water our drinking water comes from, from, from the Mississippi River and we can't drink the water. And so, 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 so these uh, companies come into St. James and they pollute us. And they tell our politicians that, they, that they're gonna be good neighbors and they are not. So we get the bulk of the sicknesses and deaths. So we want these uh, companies to be held accountable and we want the laws to be enforced. And if, if the laws are being vi violated, we want something to be done about it because we live here and we're trying to live a productive life and we try to live, a, live in a clean environment. So the citizens is the ones that have to fight these industries when our politicians invite them to come in. So thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Again, the, it's it's interesting to think about the themes of who's in power and at what level 
um, change is possible and what are the strategies to, to hear about the strategies your active the activists in your community have used to advance justice. Um, I'm going to start with you for the next question, because um, I know you've been active in this. Um, can you speak to some of the ways that um, you're working on um, engagement with the upcoming visit by the UN Special Rapporteur for Racism and how uh, your work has uh, catalyzed on um, uh, racial justice organizing? How do my, my company, my, my, my community feel about it, you say, about the uh, visit? Yeah, what are the ways that you're leveraging the upcoming visit and organizing um, for the UN Special Rapporteur on Racism's visit? Oh, well, uh, when Michael Regan came, that was a big thing to us because we felt like he cared about the community. We felt like he was interested in what's going on. He walked the streets in St. James, and that was something no other representative have done. And uh, we feel like something is going to be done. We feel like we're gonna have more fence line monitor, monitor, monitoring in St. James. And we felt like, uh, we, we felt hopeful that we're going to be listened to and we're going to be protected more because we feel like something is going to be done. And for example, like um, another component of, of, of well, what's going on with, uh, with, with our community. We speak about Black Lives Matter, but that's just one of the, the, one of, one of the components that we deal with, but also with, with, with police brutality. So right now we're going through injustice, environmental injustice. So that's some of the same things. It's just a different, but it's the same thing. We stop to think about it. And this morning on our TV, on our breaking news, we heard that uh, the Department of Justice is filing a, a lawsuit against the, the state police in Louisiana. So they can kill people, they, they, they can brutalize people. It's the same thing with us. We are being brutalized, we are being poisoned, and we are and, and we are we are dying. So that's another component of what we are dealing with. So when you look at that, you can look at our issue also. And I thought about it this morning. Maybe we need to talk to the Department of Justice because we don't have justice in St. James Parish. We, we really don't. And I think something needs to be done about that. And as being a frontline leader in St. James Parish, that's gonna be one of the things on our agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, we're with you on this. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Anne Marie, can you speak to whether you are going to be engaging with the upcoming UN Special Rapporteur's uh, visit and um, how that's kind of organizing is, is supporting the work that you do? Yeah, so just, uh, just a clarification on two different things. One, the United Nations uh, Special Rapporteur, there's one just for Indigenous peoples. So a lot of the issues go through the Indigenous peoples special repertoire. And then with regards to race, um, uh, there's a fine line between race and tribes because um, tribes have a legal definition as opposed to being separated as a race. So those are conflicts that I just wanna set the tone for. But when, we, when some of the work that we're doing um, around this topic area and up to the um, repertoire's uh, visit is just looking at how, um, uh, issues of free and prior informed consent, which comes under the United Nations uh, Rights of Declaration for Indigenous Peoples, those issues are not being addressed at all in, in the United States as well as they should be. There's an issue of tribal consultation that most of the agencies has picked up. Um, how it's applied is unique in that most tribes um, are considered sovereign, are, are sovereign nations, not considered, excuse me, are sovereign nations. So when you when the federal government or the state wants to interact with the tribe, they have to go through very special forms of tribal consultation with regards to environmental issues, all types of issues. 
And so when we're looking at those types of issues and applying them to a special repertoire, there's, you have, there's a lot of conflict there in who's getting to represent the tribe and who actually has the voice. So those all go through tribal nation leaderships. And a lot of them go through the National Congress of American Indians as well. So the, that's so that's the and free and prior informed consent is is critical in that the lands that are being uh, changed, whether it's on nation or off nation, say on a reservation, but there's a mining corporation being developed off reservation, but it the water leads right in the waterways right through the nation. So there's all these conflicts that occur um, off and off off and on reservation, and then that leads into litigation. Um, one of the other issues that I have a concern about with just with the whole special repertoire in the United Nations is um, tribes right now, even though the, in the United States, they're considered sovereign nations. However, when we go to the United Nations, we're, we're in an observer status as opposed to a membership status. And so that means that the United States represents the tribes, and this goes for all indigenous peoples throughout the, the world. We're no longer we're not allowed to speak on behalf of ourselves. We're we're in observer status, and maybe at the end of a session, they'll bring in the observers and you're able to say something. But right now, as sovereign nations, we're still not able to represent ourselves or represent our concerns. And that goes to some of the issues that um, the United Nations has put forward. Right now, um, Protect, like protecting like climate change is one of the huge largest issues. Let's just take that. It's an environmental issue. And right now, 80% of the world's cultural and biodiversity, I'm just quoting from the United Nations here, uh, is 80% of the world's cultural and biological diversity is occupied by 20% of the world's land surfaces that indigenous peoples throughout the world um, steward. You know, I won't say own because a lot of our tribes and peoples don't consider us owning Mother Earth. We consider us stewards of Earth, our Earth. So those are all issues that all, when you're talking about race and how you're going to approach a special repertoire, these are all underlying issues that have to be um, considered before we go into those conversations. So um, I just want to bring all those issues up in this conversation regarding the special repertoire. Um, the special repertoire for indigenous peoples is um, very active and and one of the issues is race, gender, all the different issues, but a lot of the concerns go through that repertoire. Thank you for providing all that context as well, Anne-Marie. Um, we're hopeful at USC, we're working to invite um, the UN Special Repertoire for Indigenous Peoples to the United States for a visit with both our Alaska communities and indigenous uh, Louisiana communities that we work with, but we heard from the State Department that um, they're so backed up after the Trump administration reign with requests that um, their focus right now is on the US Social Repertoire for Racism for the upcoming year. Um, but there's a commitment, as I understand it, uh, for the coming years ahead. So um, we'll see. Well, I guess we'll see. Um, I want to give uh, Kasha a, a chance to respond to the question as well before we move on uh, to another question. Um, Kasha? Yeah, sure. Um, one thing we're working on now, uh, there's a call for submissions with the UN Special Repertoire on Racism. Um, so we're drafting comments for that. And I think those are due on the 20th if anyone else wants to participate. Um, and our comments are focusing mostly on the failure of international climate frameworks to respond to direct concerns from um, frontline groups and also the negative impacts of existing climate mitigation interventions. Um, one thing we've been focusing a lot on is uh, carbon capture and storage and the threats that that poses for frontline groups. Um, just for example, um, there's a big intersection between petrochemicals and carbon capture and storage since the petrochemical industry is kind of pivoting towards CCS to say, this is how we're gonna solve all the issues CCS brings, um, all the issues Petchem brings to these communities. Um, but uh, carbon capture and storage itself brings with it a lot of risks. Um, and it's a false solution that even the White House Environment and Justice Advisory Council has said won't benefit communities at all. Um, and still the other departments like the Department of Energy is pouring a lot of money into this. So we're raising 
those issues and those points and um, bringing forward the fact that that money and those investments could be going towards proven solutions like renewables. So that's how we're engaging um, with that uh, visit. We think it could also be a good opportunity just to mobilize a bunch of other frontline groups um, dealing with these issues and use it as a real focus for the visit. Um, so yeah, that's how we're engaging with that process. Thank you, Kasha. Um, so I have a, a, a new question for exploration um, and I'm gonna go back to Sharon because I, Sharon, you, you were getting into this a little bit, but I'm curious to ask this question. Um, so what kinds of remedies are potentially available uh, for violations of international environmental rights? And um, what does this suggest to you? Well, I think in my own opinion, I think that we should go back to choosing representatives that's gonna represent us and not represent industry. If we can vote the people out that's in office that's voting for us to be polluted, voting for us to see cancer in our bodies and die, we need to start from zero, from, from the first phase, vote these people out, get people in office that's gonna protect us because they, they took an oath. The, the oath was to protect the people, the community. They are not doing that. We wouldn't have to form an organization to protect our community, protect our lives and to save our land because the industry is coming here and they want us to move out or die. It's no in between. We either we're gonna live or we're gonna die. If the more industry comes in here, we already have 12 in a 10 mile radius in St. James. If more come in, we will not be able, we can't breathe the air as it is right now. So my, my, my remedy to me, get them out, get them out of office because they said that this is not cancer alley. They said that God told them to vote for the plant to come in and, and pollute us. That's our biggest issue, our politicians. If the, the citizens that live there could make these decisions, trust me, we wouldn't have all of these industries in our community polluting us, destroying our soil. We can't make a garden. We can't sit on the porch for a, a long period of time and enjoy the outdoors. We used to can, can enjoy the clean air, take a fresh breath in the morning, breathe that clean air in. You will breathe in chemicals. When I, would, when I was teaching school, I would leave my house in the morning at 6.30. I wanted to go back in the house because the air was so full of chemicals. So why should we have to be a sacrifice for these industries? The industries come into our community, they make the profit and they leave us with the pain. So I have lost loved ones, I have lost neighbors. So we need to go back to square one, get the politicians out get the politicians out of our lives, the ones that are not going to protect us. And I'm willing to fight for that. Um, thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Um, I'm gonna ask uh, Katie to take this as well and speak from the, the New York perspective here. All right, so I think one, there is something incredibly powerful that a fundamental right announced in the Bill of Rights provision of a state constitution can do, which is in addition to exercising your democratic prerogative to, to boot out uh, politicians, um, a state constitutional environmental right allows courts to strike down bad laws if they infringe on a fundamental right to a healthful environment. And I think that's in terms of a potential remedy, it's something that we've seen happen in both Montana and Pennsylvania, both, both states that have environmental rights in their Bill of Rights provisions of their constitutions. And so a comment Sharon made before when she was talking about um, the state legislature in Louisiana overriding local community zoning and desires to push in dirty industry, that's precisely a context that that was the context that emboldened the Pennsylvania Supreme Court to breathe new life into their state constitutional environmental right and to use that 
in part to overturn a law the state legislature had adopted that would have forced communities to accept fracking operations in their communities. So have preempted local zoning in that regard. And, and I think that's a good example of a, of a remedy that is somewhat, somewhat unique to state constitutional environmental um, rights in this context. Another thought I have about remedies is that actually my deepest hope for the environmental right in New York is that no remedy will actually be the best remedy of all. And by that, what I mean is um, that if you think back on our, our experience in Hoosick Falls, the so Hoosick Falls is, I think it's actually a village in New York. There is a citizen who just noticed um, a lot of people, gee, it seems like a lot of people are getting cancer on his own initiative, went out and had his water tested, got the results and said, gee, there, there are these really high levels of this one kind of chemical, went on the, the good old Google machine and pretty quickly was able to see, hey, that there's pretty clear evidence that these are carcinogenic. Went down to the local drinking water authority who went to the State Department of Health who said, hey, that's no problem because those chemicals which are still under study, they haven't been regulated. Um, and when the business community opined on the environmental right in New York, their response was to say, we don't need this because all those people in Hoosick Falls, they have plenty of remedies available to them. And when you unpack that, what that really meant is, well, maybe you can sue, um, but you're living the rest of your life, right? With the fear of decades of exposure to this chemical. So that's not really a satisfactory remedy. You can also go hat in hand to politicians and ask for help, which is ultimately what they did in Hoosick Falls and the New York legislature was responsive and we did get new state laws and we do have policies now, but they had to ask for it. An environmental right empowers you to kind of demand it. But when I think about Hoosick Falls, my actual hope would be, that there would, it would just wouldn't have happened because advocates along the way would have in the context of proceedings to decide whether to regulate these chemicals been able to hold up the environmental right and maybe push for, for early, uh, earlier, uh, earlier action. Um, so, you know, other specific remedies that I think you could see for enforcement of environmental right might be challenges to the issuance of a permit or using the environmental right to argue for more stringent, um, more stringent limits uh, in, uh, in permits. Um, I will say, I think this is probably highly state dependent and we don't yet know in New York, but it does seem, I think under the case law, it would be an unusual case that would allow for a damages remedy. So the environmental right is most likely to be interpreted, applied, and understood as a limitation on government conduct. So to prevent government actors from um, violating the right, but it might be difficult to find that there would be damages that could be awarded uh, awarded for that. Although, and, and I'm sure advocates in New York for listening as they don't say that out loud, but I, that still needs to be, to be litigated. There is a path for that to happen in New York, but I think it's unlikely. Thank you, Katie. Um, I just wanted to uh, share an announcement about the CLE, CLE code before um, I move on to Anne Marie and, and Kasha for that um, uh, third question. And the CLE announcement is that the code for this panel is LKEC82. Um, so if you're looking for that CLE code, it's LKEC82. Um, and now I'm gonna move uh, on to Anne-Marie for that question about remedies available for the violations of these rights um, and what types have you seen uh, to be fruitful? Yeah, so thank you for that question. I think some of the, in the tribes in the United States, especially I'll just concentrate on the tribes in the United States for now. Um, they're really frontline workers. Um, I was part of the no Dapple um, movement and all the issues that, Think forward from that and then the divergence and then back. It, feel, it feels like you're on a seesaw really when you're working on these frontline issues and whether the administration will hear you, whether or not the administration will undertake some of the issues that you're working for. So some of the remedies that you know I, I've seen work uh, are the frontline workers. Um, it's a dangerous position, and but many of them are willing to take forward um, to protect their rice fields, to protect their water, um, drinking water. Um, these are all issues that I've seen indigenous peoples, um, not only here in the United States, but all around the world. The death rate among environmental activists 
um, for indigenous peoples is extremely high, not only not, especially outside of the United States. I mean, it's extremely high. If you're gonna fight for your environmental rights, say in other countries, I won't name them, get in trouble. And uh, you will, your, your life is online. So some of the remedies that, um, that we were talking about is just being able to have equal footing. You know, there has to be some kind of political equity first in order to safeguard these environmental activists from moving forward. You know, there's no equal bargaining position right now at, in any of the levels. Um, in the United States, it's quite different. You can go through the courts, you can go through redress and all the systems that Katie was talking about, and that all works fine. However, a lot of these tribes don't even have funding to hire an environmental attorney. You have to go, I was one of the um, few environmental attorneys um, for One Nation. And so, and when we worked in the, I was like, Katie, we worked on water rights and it was us against Goliath, you know? And so it's, it's so when you're talking about re remedies, it's not as easy just to say, okay, you have all these issues because there's a lack of power and there's a lack of funding really to support uh, going for these remedies. So I wanna really enhance that section of when we're talking about remedies. Um, the remedies that I've seen is all through the courts, as, as Katie was talking about, all the different ones. Um, we have the Native American Rights Fund that really works on high level Supreme Court issues. I think um, there's a great book, The Pendulum Swings Back and Forth on the Court as we're seeing it. And that's especially true in Indian country. One year we'll get a great hearing, court ruling, and then next year we'll have a devastating um, court opinion. And then that ripples throughout all the tribes, whether or not we were wanting, whether we brought the suit or not, because we're a tribal nation, we fit under federal regu um, re federal, federally recognized tribes, it will ripple all through the tribes. So tribes are being much more careful about the um, seeking remedy through the United States courts, just because of the court makeup right now. So there's a lot of different issues. When we're talking about state law, um, we have um, been successful. Um, the ones who are more powerful, the Heal River Indian community, like I was talking about, who I worked with, um, we um, initiated the largest water settlement in the United States. So right after we were able to initiate or implement, sorry, that water settlement, the power structure changed for that tribe. And so once you have power, once you have funding, now they're a gaming tribe, the structure will completely change. But that's an anomaly of the 574 tribes. That's an anomaly. And most tribes right now are just trying to get water settlements done, especially in the Southwest. And that's extremely hard um, due to the cost and the duration time. Right now, we call her Auntie Deb Hallen, but uh, Secretary Hallen um, is really doing some great job work with allowing tribes to work with water rights much more specifically than before. Um, I just seen a different movement. I see more funding. Again, the power structure is probably the biggest concern that I have when we're seeking remedy and how it will apply um, from one tribe to the other. Thanks, Anne-Marie. Um, so I want to, um, uh, I see a lot, there's a lot of really good questions in, coming from the audience. Um, and so I'm going to move us um, into uh, taking a few of those questions. Um, and I think one of the, a really interesting question that we um, just got was, um, what are your views about the White House report on climate change impacts on migration? which also raises issues of uh, racism. This was issued last November. Um, so I guess I'm, uh, we'll start with uh, Katie. I think um, that would be good to hear from you. And then we will uh, move from the panelists and just let me know if you haven't uh, had a chance to, um, to digest that report. <laughs> Katie, I'll put you on the spot first. Yeah, so I can tell based on who asked that question that she knows much more about it than I do. She's an expert and maybe Michelle, I don't know if you might jump on and, and um, maybe talk about it uh, a little bit. Um, I, I'm not particularly familiar with the, the report. I do know um, I'm a member of an environmental law collaborative and um, we got together last summer and 
basically it's a group of environmental law professors that pick a topic, get together, talk about it, and then write a book about it. And what we focused on last summer was um, our, you know, I hate to be a, a Debbie Downer, but our sense that we're likely headed for four degrees of warming and thinking about adaptation in that context. And one of the big issues that came up over and over and over in the course of our discussion was how to handle um, both internal and international migration and displacement in that context and thinking a little bit about how can you protect against um, discriminatory policies when you have uh, mass migration within the United States. Um, but I don't, um, I don't have much more specific to add on the, on the specific report. Um, thanks, Katie. Um, Tasha, do you have any thoughts about this specific report? I haven't dug deep into the report, but I actually had a conversation with a colleague on migration just this past week. Um, there was a big uh, gathering for climate justice and joy down in Baton Rouge over the weekend. Ms. Sharon, I think you might have been there. Um, yeah. yes. I couldn't make it, uh, but in the context of migration, we had talked about um, resilience and uh, all the, the movement of people and having uh, the need to be grounded in culture. Um, with the loss of culture in migration, it could lead to the um, loss of human rights. And so having um, people's culture be uh, central to um, these fights and making sure that their human needs are met um, with this ongoing uh, probable migration pattern is pretty uh, crucial. I've been told since eighth grade that my hometown, New Orleans, is going to be underwater eventually. So that's especially important to the communities down where I'm from. Thanks, Kasha. I think the, the issue of climate force displacement um, due to rising seas is something that we focus on quite closely in, in, at UUSC. And we also focus on um, migrant rights globally. So it's, it's just interesting to, to think about the frameworks and particularly picking up a theme from this conversation is who's at the decision-making table um, when frameworks and policies are even being um, uh, dreamed of or enacted. And there's, you know, I think we understand that there's a considerable amount of opportunity for reform in the United States with our, our FEMA um, emergency response work. And so I hope that in the next decade, um, we can build more equitable practices for, what for who can be at the decision-making ma table and what those laws and policies look like for the rights of those displaced um, due to the ongoing impacts of climate uh, erosion of land. Um, I want to ask Anne-Marie, did you have um, any more comments about the White House report on climate change impacts? I'll just make sure that I give everyone a chance to answer this one. It's okay if not. I'm sorry, you cut out just when you were saying your questions. Can you repeat the question? I just wanted to ask if you had if you had strong opinions or views on this White House report on climate change. Um, and, and on the impacts of migration. I, I think since you're in Arizona closest to the US border, um, perhaps you've thought about this uh, and, and have some context you'd like to provide. Immigration and tribal indigenous issues is always an interesting conversation, who you speak to. Uh, if you speak to an elder, they'll say, we were here first, everyone else was an immigrant. So, and so you think about those terms and how you apply those laws accordingly. And then you think about relatives who are coming from like say border towns, like um, the Southern border, you know, there's a lot of tribes that there's Donna Octum tribe right there, Pascoyaki. So there's a lot of tribes that are really on, on the border and both their relatives live on both sides and they've um, historically have been able to travel back and forth. So this whole issue, I'm just, I'm just staying in the tribal context, not the political context, because that's much, much higher. And um, yeah, so, so for tribes, it's, it's always been about um, how they protect, uh, how we protect our relatives. And so um, determining whether a relatives or relatives, another consideration. So I don't have anything specifically about that. 
um, immigration clause, but I do, I'm, I'm very appreciative of the White House's recognition of indigenous tribal and um, ecological knowledges. Um, that was a huge one for us. I've been working on that since 2014. And so uh, recognizing traditional knowledges and then applying it to federal agencies, uh, it's right now it's out for consultation. So just wanna give a props to the White House for that one. Thanks, Anne-Marie. And if we could stay with um, a specific question for you uh, at this time, um, and then I'll have one more broader question to bring back to the entire group. But so there was a question about um, working with Alaskan Native tribes, um, specifically for you, and um, the how to balance economic independence and environmental concerns, um, and how to create economic stability while adapting for climate change. Um, the uh, participant asked how mentioned that some environment environmentalists are telling the Alaskan folks what to do um, and how upsetting that is. So what are the ways that you feel um, sovereignty can be respected and uh, communities can work together around this issue? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, like I said, almost half of all the 575 tribes, I think there's 223, um, they were called Alaska Native Villages. And they're different in that they don't have boundary reservations except for one or two in the in Alaska. So really, and then they're developed by corporations. So the villages all report to a corporation. This is all under uh, Supreme Court law a long time ago. So when we're working with tribes, we really go to the heart. We really work with tribal individuals and tribal villages themselves. So we give the responsibility, the onus is on the village to bring forward their concerns and, and it's up to them. We understand there's a balance up there. There's a balance everywhere. I, I am a, I tell everyone I'm a coal miner's daughter, you know, and here in Arizona, when they cl closed down the Navajo generating station, there was a huge impact to the Navajo nation and all the families there. So the just transition, as they are calling it, is really looking at not only tribes and Alaskan native villages, but asking them how they're going to um, ec economically look at these issues and how do we move forward with them. So really being on the ground, working with them collectively, um, and, and I agree, there are some really good hearted, maybe some, maybe not so, some not great hearted environmentalists that want to do a lot of good work up there. But you do have to remember that there's decades and decades of research. Don't do any more research, please don't do that. That's just, you know, more research is just challenging for tribes when you try to say, let's do a strategic plan together. Well, they're in the middle of a fire, which is climate change, you know, so really working with tribes on the ground finding those champions that are willing to step forward and say, this is what we've done in the past. This is what we worked and not worked on. Uh, uh, and these are the plans that we've already set forward. Right now, the Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals has been working with them for since 2009 on developing adaptation plans. So they've really worked through that assessment process and many other tribes are moving forward. What we're having problems with is the implementation stage. So the implementation stage is looking at funding. Now, all the funding is just right now for adaptation, and, but now the Bureau of Interference has put forward, I think $43 million into another bank account to not entirely for implementation. But as you know, $43 million for an infrastructure project uh, in Alaska is probably not gonna go very far. So your partnership with, with municipalities is critical. And again, this is, all goes out to power structure. Who determines the priorities of infrastructure for the next 10 years. Um, and, and same for the Indian um, Health, uh, IHS, Indian Health Services, I'm forgetting the full title. They determine the infrastructure and how well are they funded to put in infrastructure. With the permafrost um, uh, changing completely up there, it's wreaking havoc on all the infrastructure that was placed in about 20 years ago. So these are all steps that um, in Alaskan native villages have to work with. And also, I would just say, again, be on the ground, be working with them, understand that they do not want any more research or surveys or anything. They have things in place already. So really take the onus upon yourself to listen to tribes first. 
Thank you, Emory. Yeah. Very long answer, sorry. <laughs> a great answer, centering the voices of those most impacted and listening carefully. I think um, that was a powerful message for all of us. Um, so the last question I'm gonna ask each of you to answer before we close out in about 15 minutes is um, a question from one of our participants who says, we're seeing more and more local communities and even tribes enact rights of nature codes. Um, can this model be used to address local environmental justice concerns? Um, so I'm gonna start with you, Kasha, um, and, and we'll work our way uh, if you have um, a few comments related to this question. Um, yeah, the enactment of the right to nature, I think could definitely be used. I'm thinking of the work we've been doing um, down in the Gulf and how um, the fossil fuel based economy is just kind of destroying the natural um, barriers to climate change down in the Gulf itself. Um, and so I think that could definitely be used to protect the natural barriers like the trees that kind of stop some of the uh, wind and water from coming in, but also um, that can also contribute to the captured carbon that they're trying to do more um, as a techno fix to some of the industrial pollution out there. So I think that can definitely be used and I think we should definitely look into it for our campaigns. Thanks, Kasha. Um, I'm gonna ask Sharon um, whether the rights of nature codes have come up in your local organizing work and, and whether that's a helpful framework for addressing local environmental justice concerns. I think it is. I think we should uh, include that into into the rights of nature because um, we have in our environment, we have the pollution that's falling on our property, on our land and the um, vegetables, our things that we grow are not being produced properly because of what's going on in our community. And I think there should be rights against that. And I think we should uh, protect nature even more in the same way we protect in our lives. Our lives matter. And uh, these industries are sh shortening our lives and the same way they're doing to nature. We, our pecan trees are not bearing like they used to. Our fruit trees are not bearing like they used to. So all of that ties in. And I think we should have rights to uh, protect nature. Thanks, Sharon. Um, I'm gonna ask Katie to go next. I know <clears throat> conceptually, absolutely, yes. I think one difficulty has been getting a foothold for um, the legal status of some of those um, local rights of nature um, ordinances or provisions. So I think, for example, in Lake Erie, their local ordinance announcing a right of nature for like, or rights of Lake Erie was struck down, I think is unconstitutionally, um, unconstitutionally vague. Um, but I can, uh, one question that I anticipate we'll be looking to answer under New York's environmental right is to understand whether the right to a healthful environment, whether that's narrowly construed only with respect to understanding impacts on human health or whether it's broader and incorporates um, ecosystem health. And I certainly favor the latter interpretation and I think there's, you know, um, it's important, but I know that there's an, there is some interesting case law under yeah, coming out of Illinois where a reference to environmental health and their constitution was held limited to human health and therefore couldn't be invoked to protect species. And so I think we'd like to see a more fulsome uh, understanding of the term healthful environment in New York to include the ecosystem, which I think is a little bit, a little bit closer to rights to nature. It's not quite the same thing, um, but at least it's not so narrowly anthropocentric, anthropocentric if it's understood that way. Thank you, Katie. Um, and Anne Marie. Thank you. I was hoping for this question. So thank you, whoever asked it. 
you know, tribes in, in the United States have been, uh, well, outside the indigenous peoples, um, many of the Maori people have um, um, declared um, rivers and lakes um, as relatives. And as in the indigenous world, um, we are the five finger beings as human beings, but we also look at plant relatives, animal relatives, and then our our mother earth, all as different as relatives. So we live in a world that's much differently. And, and, and it's difficult to think about legally because then you're trying to separate legal rights and, and possession. And it's really hard to talk to an elder about legal rights when you're talking about water or land. So I'll just tell you that straight up, that's really hard. But the different tribes like the Ho-Chunk Nation, um, they're looking at an ecosystem where it's, these are already declarations that have gone through. I was just looking it up really fast. Uh, Ho-Chunk already has an ecosystem resolution. The Ponca Nation has rights for water and clean air. And um, the White Earth Ojibwe Nation looks at um, Mo, uh, Mana, Manomen, which is their rice. So they have your rock, Nez Pierce, Menominee, all looking at rivers. So these are already being implemented. And I think as Katie is saying, once you step outside and designate it reservation lands, that's when it becomes very difficult to then enforce because a river will flow you know, right through our land territory. But we do have case law to protect upper, um, uh, if you have, then you get into religious rights, you know, protecting and looking at um, water rights, not water rights, water quality issues, and whether there's a religious impact to tribes. And there's been successful case law in the past about protecting water um, quality in that right. Uh, for, as a former water rights attorney, I'm looking at um, how do we delegate all these things in the middle of a climate um, catastrophe, if you will. If there's in, in the United in, here in Arizona, you know, if you look at the Colorado River and its impact on the different reservoirs, Page, Lake Powell, um, Lake Mead, you're seeing like we're in the greatest drought you'll ever we've ever seen in our lifetime and really looking at water rights and how that applies to tribes and even the ones we negotiated already and fought 40, 50 years for are being changed on a regular basis because of a climate change. No one considered climate change part of the negotiations 20 years ago. I can tell you that because I was right there with it. So looking at rights of nature and how it applies, I think it's a powerful tool and it's a powerful tool if it's understood, and it's a powerful tool if it can be enforced. And those are some of the things that I would really like to encourage is just looking. But for me, it teaches a different way of understanding nature. Um, it, it teaches that us as human beings, we cannot declare ourselves the most powerful beings on earth. Because right now, we're in the middle of Mother Earth saying, nope, you're not doing the correct thing and I'm adjusting for it. And so, and that's called climate change. And so it, for me, it's a teaching tool as well. I, I think that's really powerful. Thank you, Anne-Marie, so much. Um, well, I'm gonna uh, draw us to an end on this first panel. Um, and just to say, you know, we've heard about um, the ways that you all are leveraging um, human rights frameworks for environmental justice in Louisiana, in New York, um, and uh, to support Native nations um, with their challenges to uh, environmental injustice. And I think a, a common theme that has been coming from the conversation is to think about power and who's making decisions and how do you access power or how do we disrupt power? Um, uh, I'm going to be constantly thinking, Sharon, about just what you said about pushing the corrupt Louisiana politicians that are uh, causing the systemic injustice and making these decisions to give corporations more power and leverage in the communities um, for a long time. So um, as we think about the themes of extractivism, capitalism, racialized violence, uh, we can continue to think of the ways that our strategies must really dig in deep to our intersectional understanding and um, the way that we view our, our rights. Um, and I will pass it now. Thank you all again so much for being part of this um, uh, panel and for to the audience for the, the great prompting questions. Um, and thank you again, Martha, for hosting the CLE. I'll pass it back to you.
Great, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, um, uh, Rachel. And of course, the panelists are welcome to stay on and uh, and listen to the, the final panel um, here. Uh, uh, so Rachel, Anne-Marie, Katie, Sharon, Keisha, thanks so much for, for that great discussion uh, and for your engagement uh, on these issues. Um, you'll see in the posts, I hope people are, are watching the chat, we've got uh, some uh, posts on administrative remedies uh, that people have been working with, um, a call for papers from the PACE Environmental Law Review, um, another one that just came up that I haven't had a chance to look at, but from the National Lawyers Guild, um, uh, information about uh, work that they've been doing. So please take a look at that uh, and respond to those in the chat if you um, have more things to share. Um, so uh, I have a, another code uh, here for the CLE that I'm going to share before we move to the next panel. Um, this is for the New York CLE, and it is RWSN50, RWSN50. Say it one more time, RWSN50. Okay, so now we're going to uh, move to our um, second panel. Uh, we're running a little bit early, so I hope that uh, hope that everyone's here. Um, and uh, so we're going to shift now to another distinct aspect of the human right to a healthy environment, and that is its particular relevance for future generations. Um, we didn't touch on that so so specifically in the last panel, but of course that's been a theme in a lot of the litigation that's been filed or or, or uh, uh, complaints that have been brought before UN bodies. Uh, and youth activists are central to keeping the issue of climate change on the front pages and in the public eye, putting pressure on policymakers and businesses to take actions that are commensurate with the climate emergency. And we heard there that uh, Katie has already and her colleagues have already um, uh, anticipated a four degree uh, increase. Um, so it is an emergency. Um, so the question for this panel is, how can youth and advocates working with youth in the United States use international developments to further leverage action, um, or leverage further action rather? And so to moderate this discussion, we are, are happy, excited to welcome Professor Erin Daly, who has uh, served as, here she is, hi, um, as Interim Dean, Vice Dean, and Dean of Faculty, as well as the H. Albert Young Fellow in Constitutional Law at Widener University Delaware Law School. Uh, Aaron serves as the U.S. National Correspondent for the, uh, I don't speak French, so I'm going to mangle this, Centre International de Droit Compare de l'Environnement CIDCE. Um, so you can, you can explain how to say that. Um, as a member of the Normandy Chair for Peace and of the Scientific Committee of the Global Pandemic Network, and for five years she serves as the Director of the Global Network for Human Rights and the Environment. Uh, and she's a, an expert on dignity issues and is the author of Dignity Rights, Courts, Constitution, and the Worth of the Human Person. So Erin, I'll turn it over to you to introduce the panel. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Martha, and thanks to everybody for, the, for organizing this great conference and having just a really riveting conversation up until now, which I'm sure we will continue. Uh, with the next wonderful panel. Um, as Martha said, we're going to shift our focus from impacts on and um, action by and for environmental justice communities to turn our attention to those who are most impacted, but least able to protect themselves from environmental injustice, children and youth. Um, children and youth have the same uh, human dignity and the same dignity rights as everybody else, but they're the only groups who are specifically disenfranchised from the political process and from the political community. Our panelists comprise some of the world's foremost experts in, um, in this area, combining activism, scholarship, and advocacy in all of their work, working with and on behalf of uh, the next generation. The panel uh, focuses specifically on youth engagement and intergenerational obligations through an environmental justice lens in both domestic and international law. Each of the speakers is going to provide a brief overview of the issues, and then we'll have a broader discussion about the role of human rights strategies, and particularly the right to a healthy environment in US law. 
I'll introduce the panelists briefly now. You have fuller biographical information about them in the materials. So first, we'll hear from Samia Shell, a human rights and environmental justice advocate based in New York City. She's a first year law student and Ron Brown scholar at St. John's University uh, School of Law in Queens. She's served as a member of an intergenerational advisory council for a United Nations consultation where she delivered interventions on children's rights in the environment. And she's also been instrumental in the development of general comment number 26 on children's rights in the environment with a special focus on climate change. She has already done much more, but as I said, her biography, more information about her is in the materials. Samia is going to provide a brief overview from an international perspective of the UN General Assembly's anticipated recognition of a human right to a healthy environment and how it might include access to justice and remedies, as well as opportunities for participation in environmental decision making. We'll then hear about the challenges of litigating in international fora from Ramin Pejan, senior attorney for Earth Justice. Prior to coming to Earth Justice, Ramin worked for the United Nations Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and the UN Environment Program to help bridge links between human rights and, the, and environmental issues. Ramin is going to continue this international perspective, describing one of the most innovative uses of human rights strategies to advance climate justice, the recent petition to the Committee on the Rights of the Child. As a leader of the international team, Ramin will describe the petition, its goals, the forum, the victims, the legal claims, and the context in general. Next, we are delighted to have with us Julia Olson, a trailblazing leader, litigator, and legal strategist in climate and environmental law for more than 25 years. Julia is the founder, executive director, and chief legal counsel of Our Children's Trust, a nonprofit public interest law firm that provides strategic campaign-based legal services to youth from diverse backgrounds to secure their legal rights to a safe climate system. Although OCT's work has had global impact, providing support, guidance, and inspiration to justice-seeking children and youth around the world, Julia is going to bring, rights, bring human rights home, as it were, by telling us mostly about OCT's work on behalf of children and youth in suing their governments to protect their constitutional rights to a clean and healthy environment under express constitutional provisions um, particularly uh, focusing on Montana and Hawaii as examples. And she'll tell us about Held versus State of Montana, OCT's case that is likely to have the first full trial in the United States early next year. Finally, we'll hear from Jonathan Todres, a distinguished university professor and professor of law at Georgia State University uh, College of Law. Jonathan researches and writes on a range of children's rights issues. He's the co-editor of the Oxford Handbook of Children's Rights Law, and he serves on the board um, of Children, Youth, and Families of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. His work is focused primarily on children's rights and disasters, which of course are happening more and more frequently and with greater intensity due to climate change, as we all know. He'll focus his comments on some of the key challenges to engaging children and youth. What is asking such questions is what is the appropriate framework for children's substantive and procedural rights and how do children's rights align with the rights of adults to protect their environment and achieve environmental and climate justice. So you can see we have wonderful experts on this panel. I'm really excited to hear from you all. And I know our audience will be also. We have a lot to talk about in the next uh, 70 minutes or so. So let's get started. Let's begin with you, Samia. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, what is going on in the UN General Assembly? Thank you. Yes, definitely, and it's a pleasure to join all of you. I wanna start by recognizing that I'm joining this call from Lenape Hoking, which is the homeland of the Lenape people. Um, but let's get into it. So just for some context on my position within this overall context of this global campaign on the human rights to healthy environment. Um, so it really came out of civil society activism, strong push 
by climate justice groups, indigenous organizations, um, all gaining momentum to coalesce into this CSO campaign of over 1500 organizations. Um, they launched this um, petition to have other people sign on. And so then it picked up and was led by the core group. So that core group consists of Morocco, Slovenia, the Maldives, Costa Rica, and Switzerland. And so they have been really great champions over the past two or so years um, campaigning for the UN General Assembly to universally recognize this human rights or healthy environment. Um, so as it stands today, we really are on the brink of having this um, considered at the General Assembly right now in June. Um, hopefully we hear some great news as Erin was saying. Um, but overall, the gist of it still remains that um, the interpretation of what the right is um, is still being negotiated, it's still being debated. Um, although there is a large consensus on what this right means in the international context on the basis of other um, regional um, court um, interpretations based on the work of special reporters on human rights and the environment, David Boyd. Um, and so that actual right, as it has been understood, has substantive components, which include um, non-toxic environments, healthy ecosystems and biodiversity, clean air, safe and sufficient water, healthy and sustainable food, and safe climate. But then on the other side, there's this procedural aspect, which is access to justice and remedies, and then participation and decision-making. Um, so recent work has been debating what is the scope temporally of this right? Does it encompass um, past wrongs? Is it retroactive in a way, or is it just forward-looking? Um, what does this mean in terms of existing climate agreements? like the Paris Agreement for what a safe climate means actually. Um, and overall, like what is the appropriate forum um, for that to be actionable? And what will that mean for the rest of society and international law to have this right recognized at the UN General Assembly? Um, and so I hope everyone here is aware that the Human Rights Council in October of 2021 recognized this human right to a healthy environment, but not everyone in the Human Rights Council is a voting member. So the UN General Assembly would be a great um, venue to have some global consensus on having this right universally recognized. Um, and I'll stop for there for now. Thank you so much for that sort of overview and, and stage setting for us. Ramin, let's hear from you next. If you could tell us about um, your experience uh, with the petition before the Committee on the Rights of the Child. Uh, thank you, Aaron. Um, I also wanted to just give a quick recognition that I'm joining the call from the homeland of the Achaman people, which is in the area where I live in Southern California. Um, so I, yeah, I was going to talk a little bit about the, the children's rights uh, petition to the UN Children's Rights Con Committee on climate change, um, which, which um, we filed along with a law firm, Hausfeld. Um, about two and a half years ago. Um, just, to, just to give a little bit of background um, for those who are not as familiar with, with the committee, it's one of the main uh, UN treaty bodies that monitors compliance with the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which is the most signed treaty in the world. Um, every country in the world has signed it, except the United States, actually. Um, and the treaty allows certain countries have signed an optional protocol or agreement which allows individuals to bring complaints against those countries. And there's only about 34 or 35 countries that have signed that protocol and agreed to the jurisdiction of the committee. So we represented 15 youth um, from all over the world, diverse sort of like in age and background. Um, I think the youngest was 12 years old. There was a few who were indigenous uh, people, one from Alaska and one from Sweden. And the idea was to raise uh, claims against five countries who had signed this treaty, who were the five biggest emitters um, within that small group. Uh, and they were all members of the G20. So it was France, Germany, Brazil, Argentina, and Turkey. Obviously, everyone would say, well, the US was missing, India was missing, China was missing. but that was all we had to work with. Um, and so uh, we brought the case, we basically the, the main claim was that 
these countries were not doing enough to reduce their emissions to basically prevent a climate crisis. Um, and we used uh, 1.5 degrees um, as our, our sort of target, but we, we left open the idea that like, obviously that even that is not protective of human rights. Um, and um, the claims, you know, the, the CRC recognizes um, environmental harm within the convention, but it does not recognize a right to a healthy environment. So we had to, you know, have our claims be around the right to life, the right to property, the right to health, the right to culture, particularly around indigenous peoples, and of course the right for children to have decisions made in their best interest, which is a, a very unique and important right within the convention that that is is sort of recognizes the special status of children in a way that that they need more protections. Um, and, and I think that's particularly the case with climate change, you know, as as they'll experience you know, harms throughout their life and, and future generations as well. Um, I don't wanna like take up too much time more, but I guess the, the one thing I would say um, is after two years, um, we, we actually ended up losing the case on admissibility grounds. Um, as, as many of you might know, in order to bring an international claim, oftentimes you have to exhaust domestic remedies first. And there's exceptions to that if, you know, if, if domestic remedies are futile and, and you can try and make the case. Um, and I can get into that later, but we, I thought we made a pretty darn good case about um, why these 15 youth from Nigeria to the Marshall Islands could not bring domestic cases in France, Germany, Turkey, Argentina, and Brazil. Um, but the committee just didn't want to go there. Um, and I, again, there's a, I think there's a quite a nice backstory to that. Um, but yeah, we ended up losing on that issue, but I think the decision ultimately was, was a very good one, um, even though we lost. Um, in a lot of ways, it progressed the norms a lot in terms of recognizing sort of transboundary obligations, the links between causation and human rights, and things of that nature. Um, and so in a lot of ways, experts and you know, people in academia have, have looked to that decision as really moving things forward. But of course, for the petitioners, it, it, it doesn't feel that way. It feels like a loss. Um, and I can again talk more about that, but I think I'll stop there, Aaron. Thank you very much, Ramin. Obviously, yeah, there is a lot more to talk about, and I'm sure people in the audience will want to hear some of that backstory. Um, for now, let's go to Julia next, and if you can tell us about the amazing work that you've been doing. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Erin. Thank you to all the organizers for bringing us together. And I'm joining the call from the homeland of the Kalapuya people um, and other indigenous peoples and now known as Eugene. So I'm here to talk about our state cases primarily, but I'll touch on some of our federal work as a comparison. So two cases to point out. Uh, one was just filed last week. It's a case against the state of Hawaii under the Hawaii Constitution on behalf of 14 youth, um, nine of which are uh, native Hawaiian. and. That case is brought under two provisions. So one is an express provision in the Constitution of Hawaii that protects a clean and healthful environment. And one is their codified public trust provision, both of which are have very strong precedent from the Supreme Court in Hawaii, um, but haven't been used directly in this context yet to protect what I'll call climate rights. Um, the harms that the youth bring forward in these cases are um, harms to burial grounds that are being swept into the sea, harms from flooding and fires, harms to the land and the ability of indigenous youth and their families to grow their cultural foods and participate in their traditional ceremonies. Um, so a wide range of harms because Hawaii is experiencing a lot of what is happening with climate crisis. And, um, that case is in its early stages. What's different about that case from a lot of our children's trust cases is we're focusing in that instance on the transportation system in Hawaii. So Hawaii actually has great laws on the books about getting to zero emissions. Um, 
and they aren't doing it. And, and their transportation emissions are the, the area that's really growing and not planning for electrification. So we're focused on transportation in Hawaii. In Montana, the held versus state of Montana case, that case has been going for a couple of years now and we are deep in trial preparation. Uh, Montana is also a, an explicit constitutional provision that protects the right to a clean and healthful environment that has also been used in a lot of different contexts in Montana. In Montana, we're challenging the energy system, so the whole <clears throat> shebang, and express statutes that are on the books in Montana that require the state to promote fossil fuels and fossil fuel development. Um, so statutory challenge, system challenge, and we're going to trial in February of 2023. We have 12, uh, 14 experts, and the state just gave us their experts, including one climate denier. So they are taking the position in Montana that climate change is not human caused. So it will be the, fir the world's first, I think, full trial, trial on behalf of children in this context of this statutory provision. So really important. And um, the last thing I'll just say is where there aren't express provisions to a clean and healthful environment or climate rights, um, we use right to life provisions, we use right to liberty provisions, we use right to health and safety, sometimes security. So there are a lot of ways to get at climate and environmental rights. Um, as implicit in other rights. And so that's a big part of our work um, and is central to the Juliana versus United States case. And I think I'm probably at my time too. Thanks so much, Julia. And again, much more to talk about there. Um, Jonathan, let's turn next to you. Thank you, Erin. Um, I too wanna to thank uh, Northeastern University School of Law and the other network partners that helped put on this program. And I want to acknowledge that uh, I join you from uh, Cherokee lands that um, the city of Atlanta was built on and my neighborhood was built on. And also uh, that forcibly, more recently, forcibly relocated uh, Black communities uh, that had been here for many more years. Um, so um, I'm delighted to be part of this program and, and I'm really genuinely uh, excited that we have an opportunity um, to talk about uh, issues confronting young people. I've been working on children's rights issues for many, many years, really, since I was a child. Um, and my entry point in, into uh, today's discussion is really twofold. The first is, for about the last dozen years, I've spent some of my time working on children's rights in disaster settings. And by that, I mean from preparedness in advance of disasters uh, to what happens during a disaster and then in reconstruction, reconstruction efforts. Uh, and then the second, so that's one piece that's brought me here. And the second piece is, as Katie uh, in the first panel referred to, um, if we are facing four degrees increase uh, potentially, um, and the reality is if you think about children's issues or children's rights or really any issue, we all need to be thinking about the climate uh, crisis. Um, so uh, children, uh, as many of you on the call know, constitute about a third of the world's population and more than one out of every five people in the United States is under the age of 18. And yet they remain marginalized when it comes to law and policy discussions and actions. Um, disasters don't change this at all. Um, often what you see in disasters in another context, the children are used as the face of disasters and the impact of disasters. Uh, and we see that done not just by governments, but also well-intentioned uh, non-governmental organizations. Um, despite, um, despite that attention in media portrayals, um, children and youth are relegated to the margins and not adequately accounted for in uh, disaster response initiatives or even disaster preparedness. Uh, and yet they're typically the most hard hit population. Um, so um, I wanna keep my initial comments thought, uh, short. So I, I just wanna mention three points. One is, um, there's a variety of international law sources that we can talk about today from different human rights law to international disaster response law, which is still developing and emerging. Uh, but for me, the ch international children's rights law framework is really where it starts um, and really is the foundation because children's rights law provides a mandate for ensuring children have access to healthcare, education, housing, 
basic nutrition and more. And these are really the foundations for res resilience and healthy development. So I think that comprehensive framework that you find in the conventional rights of the child really offers that, um, even though even acknowledging that the US is the only country in the world not to ratify the CRC. The second point I wanna make is uh, that children are experts on their own lives. And too often we, we don't acknowledge this. Uh, the Convention on the Rights of the Child in Article 12 says that children have a right to be heard on matters that affect their lives. And certainly what's happening to the environment um, is affecting their lives dramatically. Um, and we see millions of children mobilizing to act on climate change, racial injustice, gun violence, and other issues that are uh, affecting their lives. And yet governments are often very reluctant to create pathways for children to be heard. And this is really critical. And, and there's a glaring example from the last couple of years um, in that um, young people may not be experts on educational pedagogy. Not many of us are, in fact, um, but they're the only ones alive today who have lived through a pandemic and know what that experience is of navigating school and education in a pandemic. And yet too often, we don't even ask them what their experience has been as we design educational policy. Um, so the last point, that brings me to my last point I'll, I'll make in sort of this opening, um, and that is one of mainstreaming. Um, mainstreaming has been used in other contexts. I've been working on it in the children's rights context for many years, and we need to mainstream children and children's rights and by mainstream, mainstreaming children's rights to me means at least two things. One is we have to account for children's rights in all sectors of society. And that means not just the usual suspects of, we think about children when it comes to education or maybe primary health care, but we need to be thinking about the impact on children and on children's rights for urban planning, transportation, and a host of other sectors of society where children don't even um, register typically among policymakers. And the second thing is not just every sector, but we need to be thinking about every stage in the develop of, development of law, policy, and programs, right? From design to implementation, to monitoring and evaluation, young people need a voice in what's happening and what's, what's being developed to respond to the issues they face today and the issues they will confront tomorrow. I'll stop there. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you so much. Um, and thanks to all of you for keeping your, your introductory remarks very brief. That does leave us a lot to talk about. I want to um, invite everybody in the audience to pose questions in the chat if you'd like. There is so much to talk about here. And I thought what we might do is sort of organize the conversation in the remaining time that we have into sort of three categories of, of questions that we might address. One sort of looking at framing and conceptual questions, um, sort of picking up on, on where Jonathan left off a little bit. Um, and a second about the challenges specifically of litigating internationally and domestically um, on behalf of and with youth and children. And then last specific challenges relating to engaging children and youth in judicial and in political and broader social fora. So if those kind of make sense as ways to organize the conversation, let me just start with a general question sort of of the theme of this, of this conference, which is about how you see the relationship uh, between the right to a healthy environment um, at an international level and or at a domestic level, um, the relationship between that and environmental justice specifically. And I wonder if, um, Samia, you might be willing to start us off to talk about that relationship between the right to a healthy environment and environmental justice. Yes, definitely. Um, I love having this question because I think it's an element of conversation about right to a healthy environment that cannot be separated. These concepts of a right to a healthy environment and environmental justice are complementary um, and something that I like to say is that the right to a healthy environment is the unspoken assumption of environmental justice. Um, so there's this premise that if we are entitled to uh, participation in the decisions that affect our environment, if we need to recognize the unique place-based relationships that people have with their environments, and if we are to have equitable distribution of environmental harms and environmental benefits, then beneath all of that, we have to be thinking naturally, oh, we, we must have this right. This must be something that we all possess. And so to dig a little bit deeper into that, I think recognizing a right to a healthy environment internationally, but also domestically 
hits on that first point of equity, the allocation of environmental burdens and benefits, but also the allocation of resources in terms of funding, um, in terms of how we are to adapt to climate change. I think those are all intertwined in conceptions of environmental justice um, and climate justice, and then food justice as another tangent attached to that. Um, and of course, the first panel really touched on this extremely well that these concepts of equity and burdens and benefits are going to overwhelmingly benefit black and brown people, um, indigenous people, women and children, and just um, what we would consider immigrants or um, you know, other people that have been particularly marginalized, especially in the United States context, but also internationally, as we start to think about um, climate migration um, and other issues that will come up ostensibly with the impending you know, threat of climate change. Um, but also in addition to that, I think that um, the right to a healthy environment within this concept of environmental justice helps us think about access to justice and participation. And so especially, I think this is something that Jonathan will touch on very well, um, just based on experience, um, but especially for children and youth that are not um, represented democratically, you know, or do not have the capacity and usual circumstances to engage in decision-making processes are usually just not considered overall. I think in terms of an international context, we will see um, more robust mechanisms, especially in um, intergovernmental bodies, things like Youngo, which is the youth constituency to the UNFCCC, that's something that I'm a member of. And even within that, um, having a, a body to organize youth internationally, there still are many things that are lacking, you know, moments where youth are last minute included in international negotiations, um, you know, just other strategic and lo logistical aspects in decision making processes that I think can be made more robust in a perspective of having environmental justice amplified by recognition of this right. Um, and then there's also on a community level, when we talk about participation, I think that actually means meaningful participation in decision making processes. So when there is notice and comment, not just some willy nilly notice in the United States context of, you know, you'll show up to a meeting and maybe you'll get to make something or some intervention, but it actually means that giving communities substantial opportunities to come together, agree on things that are acceptable or that are not acceptable. And to be able to comment on remedies that are going to take place in their communities in a substantial way. And I think that's a, a shift in perspective um, rather than making decisions on behalf of communities, but rather putting the power in their hands to have agency over things that affect where they live and where they work and where they play. I mean, I also think in terms of access to justice, it provides an actionable right, you know, something that people can go into courts and other, you know, administrative settings and say that um, this right has been infringed and we are entitled to have um, a remedy imposed there, whether that's something like injunctive relief or whatever the case may be in terms of how this takes shape in the United States in particular. And I also find an aspect of transparency and accessibility that is inherent in a conception of environmental justice that people have a right to know, to a free prior and informed consent, that they should be able to access you know, the studies and other things that occur where they live, um, and also, I think it propels aspects of, you know, democratic process of having people engaged, and having people aware of what's happening around them. Um, but lastly, in terms of recognition, which is the last pillar of environmental justice, it means that for indigenous peoples, especially for people whose ways of life are inherently attached to their li living environments, that these relationships cannot be seen as, um, you know, an add-on or something optional to consider when we make decisions. Rather, it's something that's necessary, you know, something that's vital. And I and I want to touch on that more um, later, you know, with the opportunity. But um, and I'll leave it lastly at you know, having especially for environmental human rights defenders who are experiencing you know persecution, especially indigenous peoples, women and girls who are defending their environments, to give them um, access to justice to allow their fam their families, you know to have a course of action for them when terrible things happen to them as well. Um, but that's what I foresee, you know, in terms of environmental justice uh, and the right to healthy environment. Thank you so much for that, Samia. That's just a brilliant intervention. I'm wondering if anybody else on the panel would like to speak to this issue. As Samia just raised a whole bunch of different ways of, of thinking about this relationship between the right to a healthy environment on the one hand and environmental justice issues on the other. 
And I'm guessing that those of you on the panel have, have thoughts about it. Uh, so I'd just like to open it up to Jonathan or Ramin or Julia, if you'd like to jump in. I have just one one quick addition, just I fully agree with what Samia said, and I think in the litigation context, so the vast majority of our youth, just through their stories and the harms that they're experiencing with climate crisis are bringing in issues that are environmental justice issues, right? Like, and it's through that storytelling that it really comes in and is so obvious and it's it's just so prevalent that it's inescapable. I think they're inseparable issues at this point in, in the world. Thanks for that. Jonathan or Ramin? I, I, yeah, I don't really have much to add. I thought Samia did a great job. Um, I, I would just agree that I think as a framing human rights generally dovetails very nicely with environmental justice and I think principles that are key to human rights, like non-discrimination, you know, elevating the, the vulnerability of certain groups and um, sort of recognizing that they have heightened protections and rights. I mean, these are all very nice principles that really align nicely. Um, so I, I think there's a lot, as Simia said, to, to really explore and, and use um, in this space. Yeah, I mean, I think Samia captured it and has the beginnings of an article there. Um, you know, I, I mean, I don't, I, and as Julia said, they're inseparable at this point. I, I don't think you get um, a right to a healthy environment for all without without justice, empowerment, equity. Um, yeah, I don't, they just, you can't separate them anymore. I don't know if you ever could. I'm wondering, Jonathan, if you, there's anything you'd like to add in particular about the procedural issues of in the procedural pillars of the right to a healthy environment and environmental justice that Samia had mentioned. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, there's a lot to say there. I mean, I think this is a, a bigger conversation in, in terms of um, thinking about process um, I think in the moment we say procedural, I immediately think it's sort of the very technical sort of narrow law sense of it. But when we think about process more broadly, um, I think one of the things that Samia highlighted that I think is really important is uh, distinguishing between participation and meaningful participation. And the goal has to be meaningful participation. Um, and that's challenging. Um, you know, I think we, we look first to, and, you know, in my opening comments, I pointed out how government doesn't provide many opportunities for young people to have um, uh, to meaningfully participate in how we respond to the challenges to our environment and our, our well-being. Um, but it's not just, you know, it's easy to point the finger at the government, right? And, uh, it, you know, the, the tougher questions in some respect come to what do I, what are we as allies uh, need to do or what are we doing or not doing and I think um, one of the questions that I always come back to which is relevant to the process question um, is what what have I changed how how do I do business differently to elevate young people and give them meaningful opportunities for participation and power sharing right and if the answer is I just I talk about how important it is, but then my organization hasn't changed at all, then we're just as, we're, you know, 99% of the way there to being exactly the same, just as much of the problem, right? And so I think we really have, you know, all of us in this space who work on human rights issues really need to ask these tough questions about our own work about, you know, what does it mean to have meaningful youth participation? And what does that mean in terms of how must our organizations change? to enable that to occur. I'll stop there. Thank you so Can I much. hop in? Yeah, of course. I just wanted to give an example um, that I wanted to mention about environmental justice and the right to a healthy environment being complementary. And this is a domestic example. So New Jersey's environmental justice law of 2020 um, in their preamble finds that New Jersey residents, regardless of income, race, ethnicity, color, national origin, have a right to live, work, and recreate in a clean and healthy environment. And then the law goes on to establish an entire permitting mechanism 
to protect overburdened communities, such as the term they use, from, in, from environmental and public health stressors, um, and then has substantial provisions for meaningful public participation. So I think that's an example of how enshrining this right can give you know, statutory authority to then create other legislation that promotes environmental justice and climate justice. Thanks, that's a great example. And I think it's so helpful to have an example like that to sort of see what language looks like um, that could be used to sort of draw these, um, draw this complementarity into a tighter relationship. Um, I'd like to ask a, a different kind of framing question, maybe sort of more on the substantive side, but several of you, Ramin and Julia mentioned um, sort of making claims in the absence of a right to a healthy environment and how when there is a right to a healthy environment, you can use that. But if there isn't one, you can sort of work around it by talking about the right to life, other kinds of uh, right to health, other kinds of rights that, that might be relevant. So I'm wondering what the implications are that you see in your work for a right to a healthy environment, whether at the international level, as we've been talking about, or at the constitutional um, or even sub and federal and, and constitutional state level, um, or even as Samia just mentioned at a statutory level. What are the implications of a right to a healthy environment, an explicit such right for children and for future generations? And I wanna just ask you also sort of a, a question that's embedded in that, which is whether you see that there's any kind of difference or different kinds of implications when you're talking about the impacts on children on the one hand and the impacts on future generations on the other hand. Um, and I'll, I'll just open that up to anybody who would like to, to jump in. That's a big question, Erin. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so I'll, I'll do my best to at least try to tackle part of it from my perspective. I think what we've seen in our practice is that if you have an explicit right to a healthy environment in a constitution, for example, then you don't have to have a big argument over whether that right is implied in the right to life. But I'll say that I think because it's so hard to get every constitution amended or perhaps to have the UN recognize that right, that I do think it's really vital that courts around the world where it's appropriate in a legal system to identify that that is an implicit human right, right? That like the right to a, an environment that sustains human life is part of the right to life. So while I think it's helpful in some respects with access to justice, um, I also think if we limit that right to constitutions that have it expressly stated, and then people who live in jurisdictions where it's not expressly stated can't um, protect that right constitutionally, then we're in a hard place. So that, that's my perspective on that piece. And I think um, one really core issue, and maybe we'll get to this, you can stop me um, if this is not the moment, but is how do we define that right and how do we set meaningful standards for that right? So, you know, when Samia was talking about the, the United Nations, the General Assembly, considering whether to make this right part of international law, um, I, I heard, you know, they're looking to, should the Paris Agreement be used as interpreting that right? And, um, you know, most folks who know our work know that we don't rely on the Paris Agreement for setting a standard for how to really protect that right, because 1.5 degrees Celsius of heating of the planet is catastrophic for humanity. It is ca catastrophic for children, future generations, and any kind of environmental justice, because frontline communities and communities of color and indigenous communities will be hurt the worst, right? And, and so, one thing that we bring, and I think Jonathan, this goes to what you were saying about meaningful participation, is young people don't want adults, be it courts or the United Nations, to set dangerous standards for those rights. So what it means to have a healthy and safe environment or a clean environment cannot be defined by a dangerous scientific or unscientific standard. 
So how we get to those definitions that interpret constitutions or United Nations um, international law is really important. And every child who you know, is involved with an adult or represented by an attorney should be asked that question. Are you okay with us setting a target for heating the planet that is dangerous to your health and well-being? Right? That's meaningful participation and responding honestly to them when we say we're setting a standard that's dangerous. So, you know, how we interpret these provisions is really critical and science has to inform it. For those of you who are just listening to this but not watching, I'll narrate that as Julia is asking these not quite hypothetical questions, Samia is shaking her head and saying, no, we are not okay with that. Um, thank you so much for, the, for raising those, those kinds of issues because obviously that's, that's key to what we're all doing is trying to figure out what exactly that right would mean. What are the implications for jurisdictions that don't have that right and how do we set appropriate standards in, in interpreting it? Um, Ramin, any thoughts about the impact of, of the right to a healthy environment at the international level and how it would affect either our understanding or litigation um, of the kind that you were engaged in? Yeah, um, you know, unfortunately at the international level, even let's, you know, the Human Rights Council has now recognized, you know, through their resolution, the right to environment. And, uh, it, you know, if we can get it in General Assembly, that's great. But when we're talking about like hard sort of treaties at the international level, there is no right to environment explicit. Um, of course, you know, the, the idea that Julia has, you know, we, we also based our claims on other rights, this idea of greening, you know, existing rights. I mean, at this point, I think it's well established that most of these fundamental rights and other rights have environmental harms as a, as, a, as a violation of those rights. It's, it's probably undeniable at this point. Um, but that being said, I, I think with certain issues like climate change, we're still in sort of gray area where we really need to push hard because climate change is a way more complex, complex issue than let's say a factory emitting pollution and harming a community that lives downstream, right? I mean, there's multiple I mean, there's, it's just a much more complex issue and particularly around future generations and children, I think there's a lot to, to develop at the international level. And, you know, of course, it's really exciting to, to be talking about a right to a healthy environment at the international level. And of course, it is great, as Julia said, if you have it like in South Africa, in the constitution, and they're bringing claims based on it, climate change claims. And you know, they've done so in France and other countries where there's an explicit reference. But they're, they're, it's very powerful to use, for example, the right to life, particularly around injuries in the future. I mean, it's very clear, for example, the Human Rights Committee has recognized that foreseeable risk of injury and, and, and imminent threat of injury constitute violations. And taking those kind of principles and applying it to climate and future harm is essential um, to start talking about you know future future generations. Um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll stop there. And I, the one 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 other thing I would add is, you know, the rights environment is it, at this point it's much stronger at the, on the procedural side for sure. Um, I think, as Julia said, there's a lot of open questions about how do you set substantive standards and you know, we have to push really hard there. Um, and with the Children's Rights Convention, I really think the principle of um, making decisions for, for the best interests of the child is a really, really important one when it comes to framing harms and, and harms around future generations and talking about climate change in particular. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much. I want to ask a couple of questions that have been have come to us from the chat. And the first one I just want to address um, is about this. I'm going to read the question, then I'm going to just repeat the code for the CLA. So I'll give you guys a moment to think about the question, then we'll come back to it. But the question um, is, I'm wondering about um, if folks can speak to the issue of militarization um, when protecting the environment in a human rights context. Is that an obstacle? Um, 
um, is that an obstacle or tension in getting the UN General Assembly to adopt a right to the environment? Also thinking about Julia's work in areas like Hawaii, where the US military is responsible for immense environmental degradation. So I'd like to ask you to think about that. I will also just repeat the code for the CLE. It is DPXB69. So let me repeat that again, DPXB69. And now let me turn back to the panel and ask for your thoughts about this issue of militarization in thinking about um, how we advocate for and implement uh, rights to a healthy environment, particularly in environmental justice con um, context as it relates to kids. So let me just open that up to anybody who would like to jump in. Can I, can I give the rest of the panel even more time by jumping back to the prior question uh, for a moment? Um, because it's, I just wanted to squeeze in one comment on the last one, uh, building on what Julia and Ramin said. Uh, you know, I think one of the real tensions in human rights law, and, and it's coming up again in the right to, the health, right to a healthy environment, is on the one hand, in the, as we negotiate and try and get buy-in, we say to states, don't worry, this is really building on existing law. It isn't radically different. And on the other hand, what we are saying is, if that's all it is, it's to Ramin's point about, you know, this isn't just a single factory. This is a really complex issue that presents grave threats to populations uh, across the globe. And if, if we are going to develop the content of the right to a healthy environment in a way that's responsive to, the, to what we potentially face, then it has to be much more. Um, and, and that's, I think we just have that unresolved tension on the one, and this comes up in, you know, for human rights advocates working in the US, on the one hand, we are constantly trying to convince the government, you know, consider ratification of a human rights treaty, don't worry, it's not going to change things radically, but that undermines the impact in a way by saying it's not going to. Um, and I think, I think for our right to a healthy environment to be meaningful, it really has to be on the sort of bold, radical end of things. Otherwise, it is an incremental change that is um, going to be something we all celebrate, but doesn't have the impact that it really needs to have. Um, so hopefully I've stalled enough for the next question. I would Thank love you. to was, hop in. Yeah, not only a good stall, but, but also a very interesting point that you raise also. So thank you for that. Um, anybody would like to, would anybody like to um, talk about this question of militarization? So may I see you nodding? I do. I, I want to, you know, pivot from the previous question, but then also move to the militarization question, if that's fine. So um, in response to Jonathan, I think um, one big thing that I've been able to see just in my personal experience, you know, attending these um, events with different member states and their representatives and issues that they raise um, I think that's definitely something that countries like the United States, um, you know, China and others are very concerned about just logistically and the optics of feeling like, you know, you're taking responsibility for all of these carbon emissions and what does that mean for us in terms of liability, uh, what does that mean for us in terms of loss and damage, you know, there are just so many other questions that arise from having this recognized and so I think definitely the approach is to say that it's not you know, revolutionary, but at the same time, um, we have these numbers that 80% of um, countries around the world contain this right to healthy environment in their constitutions um, or in their statutes or other laws. So I think at this, while it is not, you know, a drastic change, it, it would be something in terms of philosophy and perspective, a very radical shift. Um, and also on the intergenerational point that was raised at first, I definitely think that um, it creates this, like I was saying, you know, this where we place ourselves in, in reference to the environment, um, in reference to economy, you know, children, youth. I think that's definitely what this right can do for future generations. I think it can place them as if they, you know, already existed today. I, I know in a lot of different systems, that's not something we consider, you know, future generations to be represented by a guardian or some other um, that have rights today. Um, but I think that's definitely something that I would hope, you know, emerges from this. 
Um, and so for the question on militarization, this is something also brought up from my experience attending and being in these um, consultations is that that's something that Slovenia raised in the context of, you know, what's going on in Ukraine um, and, you know, just overall, you know, war and that can we have a right to a healthy environment and at the same time say that, you know, we are possessed nuclear weapons and that, you know, we are engaging in more imperialism around the world. Um, and so one of the immediate answers that David Boyd, the special reporter on human rights and the environment gave was no, you know, those two things cannot coexist. Um, and so I think it creates greater questions of, you know, how can we achieve peace and justice? And at the same time, want to balance our interests in, um, you know, climate justice. And also what we've seen is this departure from focus on climate justice and climate action in the midst of all of these, you know, of war and having to produce more things and just the overall impact of what military production has on the US economy. And I think it's one of the biggest contributors of carbon emissions that the United States has is our actual military industrial complex. So I think that's a great question. Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. And I think a um, couple of other factors, these are not necessarily totally connected, but on the topic. In Ukraine right now, for example, there are environmental human rights lawyers collecting evidence and documenting what is happening to the environment to establish a case for um, hopefully environmental war crimes um, and, and other cases going forward. So obviously it's very real that there's real destruction. And um, my colleague who works on our global climate litigation comes from that human rights background dealing with war crimes. and in every country she's been in, um, including helping Syrians, people who are there fighting war, one of the top concerns is what's happening with climate crisis and what's happening to their, their water and their land because of the war activities, right? So it's, it's so interconnected on the ground for people. And I think turning back to the United States as an example, it's my understanding that our country is one of the only countries that fought against the recognition by the committee of a right to a clean and healthful environment. And the reason behind the scenes by the negotiators is they were, they're concerned about the United States being opened up to more liability, like loss and damage, as Samia says, right? And, and it tells you something <laughs> because of our contribution to all of this. On the litigation side, which is sort of a different lens to look at this issue, um, when you get into militar militarization issues and foreign policy, it makes access to justice harder, right? So there's also that tension. Um, but we do have a, at least a record in the United States of our courts hearing cases, even when it's about the military causing harm, even when it's about foreign policy decisions causing harm, but they're harder cases to actually litigate. So there's that angle um, on the issue as well. But, oh, and one last thing I'll just add is if you look at the military in the US on climate, it's different, right? Because they see what climate crisis is doing to their operations globally and the increase in um, chaos and war and migration. And so I think the military is perhaps a different kind of player on climate than it is on other sort of more traditional environmental harm issues. I think that last point by Julie is really interesting uh, because I think that um, you know all of us working on human rights issues have um, faced countless examples of governments choosing national security over human rights, uh, and um, you can see it playing out again, right? National security, where you know the installation and the maintenance of bases. Um, that's a security issue, at, regardless of what the environmental impact is. Um, but uh, to Julia's last comment, I think that presents some interesting opportunities to reframe for the military how, how they might uh, approach some of these issues. I'm going to end glass half full. Thank you for that. It's so hard to do in these conversations, but we appreciate the effort. Um, let me ask a, another sort of set of questions that have come up in the chat, and I'm just going to combine a few of the questions because they're turning around sort of a similar theme. 
which is something we haven't talked about yet, which is economics. And um, what some people have phrased in the, in the chat is sort of the cost benefit analysis from an administrative perspective in terms of regulation and how agencies are, are um, incorporating cost benefit analysis into their environmental regulations um, on the one hand, but also sort of the question of, of the tension between cost benefit analysis on the one hand, which sort of implies a short term um, calculus compared to the considerations that we would like um, actors to make, which is more long-term looking at our children's lives, their children's lives and going on down into, as they say, into the seventh generation to sort of pick up on that indigenous um, framework. So I'm wondering if, if you can talk about how you see um, what, what strategies you would use in your advocacy and the litigation um, to sort of bring to bear a reasonable way of thinking about economic impacts. And again, I'll open it up to whoever would like to jump in. So I'm excited about this question because we're doing this in our cases. One of the most destructive economic practices that is used by governments around the world, and it's been used by the IPC, IPCC and its climate models and the integrated assessment models is discount rates. And what discount rates are, and they're, they're anywhere from 3%, 5%, 7%, They've gone as low as 2.5% in the US to take into account the social cost of carbon. But discount rates devalue life in the future. And they actually treat children as less than a whole human being. And it's really, really significant how even a small discount rate like 2% can completely change the economic analysis of decisions we're making today where we value the money today more because we're gonna leave it to future generations to deal with the problem. And this practice, um, we actually bring this as part of our litigation and our lawsuits challenging these discount rates as unconstitutional because they are actively discriminating against children and denying them equal protection of the law. And what our economics experts say, including Nobel laureate, Dr. Joe Stiglitz, is in the context of climate crisis, governments should not be discounting these, these decisions in the lives of children and, and unborn children. And, and so it's a huge issue. And I think it also goes under the radar. So most people probably don't know that the IPCC has embedded in its analysis these discount rates that devalue children. And this is the information going to decision makers that they're then setting standards based on or telling us how feasible it is to do a transition. So really, really important question and something that we're dealing with in our cases uh, across the board. So thanks for that. We want to hear from the other panelists on this issue also, but Julia, would you mind just explaining what you mean by the discount rate? Yeah, so um, for example, so right now in the United States, um, both EPA and the Department of Transportation are looking at setting new vehicle emission standards, right, CAFE standards. And when they do that, they're looking at the cost benefit of setting particular standards. And they take these discount rates and they're using 2.5, um, 3%, 5% um, right now. And and what that means is when they're looking at the benefit of, of increasing um, fuel efficiency or decreasing emissions, they're actually showing less benefit because they're discounting the value of that benefit over time. Okay, so it's really valuable if, if we can have an impact today, but in 30 years, we're not going to value that as much. And conversely with costs. And Economists explain this way better than I do, but it, it literally is like it's treating someone today who will be alive in 10, 20, 30 years as less valuable and the benefit to them is less valuable. So in some instances, it means that when all of this goes up to the people who are looking at budget decisions, is it worth investing this money today and making this policy today? Or can we put it off because someone in the future can deal with it? They, they, we frequently have put it off. And a lot of it has come from this economic analysis. And, and one last thing that's really important people don't understand is 
um, the discount rate dictates the social cost of carbon. So the reason our governments want to keep the discount rate high is it keeps the social cost of carbon low. So if you set a 0% discount rate, which is really what it should be, the social cost of carbon is enormous right now. And so it's all about economics, um, but it really has huge implications for young people and future generations. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, and also thank you for that, for Karen's comment in the chat of uh, further elaborating on this. Uh, let me ask um, others on the panel if you'd like to comment on um, generally or any specific aspect of this question of weighing costs and benefits and how, how in the present that's problematic, uh, but also in terms of how it impacts children and, and future generations, if you have any thoughts about Samia, go ahead. <laughs> oh, no. Um, I was just going to make a small insertion that um, through my experience with the United States Agency for International Development, you know, this is in a developmental context. Um, but, you know, I think that's a lot of what we will be seeing in terms of sustainable development. Um, what could this right do for that? And I think um, through my work, I have been advocating for the agency in their processes of developing projects um, in other countries to consider environmental justice indicators um, in their impact assessment. And so that's not something that's currently done um, and trying to integrate those considerations because still there's this conception that environmental issues are separate from social issues, are separate from climate issues. Um, and so I think definitely having this right um, being the underlying perspective of how we approach development will also be very beneficial to those cost benefit analyses and other impact assessments that are factored in. Thanks so much. Ramin? Thanks, Erin. I didn't want to add too much. I, I just wanted to talk about in, in the context of some of my other work um, where we where we support challenges um, and engagement with public utilities. Um, so, so basically where energy policy is, is made, which is obviously not, it, it's very related to preventing climate change. But a lot of times what we see is when, when scientists or experts are doing modeling around various energy options for the future, they don't in integrate environmental harm at all into the cost. And that's really a huge problem, which um, in other countries in particular, we've, we've really been trying to change that practice. But within the profession of economics, it's, not, it's just not a standard thing that you do. And so there's a, there is a problem on the, like, as, as Julia said, there's problems with even the, the, the entities that we look to to provide the best science are doing things incorrectly. Um, and I and I wanted to make another pitch for the social cost of carbon, not necessarily in the U.S. because it's it's running into like obstacles here, but certainly in other countries, it's a really powerful argument. And of course, you know, I agree with Julia. You know, that could be distorted and and artificially lowered, you know, depending on on like discount rates and things like that. But it is a very good way to to bring in an extra cost associated at least with climate so much. Um, I wanted to ask one other question um, that also came to us in the chat, and this is really sort of, I think, like a litigation-oriented question. Um, uh, Sarah says that she's interested in the, in the question of how to overcome the burden of injury to human rights, which the international human rights framework, um, within the international human rights framework, I'm sorry, when inter environmental harm is so difficult to prove, especially for children, and for future generations. So I'm wondering if those of you who have um, worked particularly in the litigation context um, can talk about proving injury. I, I might just add to my previous answer with this one. I mean, I, I talked about some, a lot of rights have been interpreted to, to not just be about present harm, but about foreseeable harm. So I think that's, again, really relevant here when, when we're talking about injury. 
Um, I also think it's important to make a distinction between, in, for example, if you're bringing an international human rights claim around policy change or, or something else, and it's not a loss and damage case, um, it's a lot less complicated. I mean, yeah, it is a lot less complicated when you're not talking about trying to come up with a damage figure, for example, in a loss and damage case. Um, and in, that, in those cases where you're not talking about monetary damages, I think you know, the attribution science is also very important, like when, with climate change. I mean, that is becoming much stronger. And um, I, think, I think, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's definitely something that, that goes way much further when, when in those kind of like policy challenge cases where you're trying to attribute emissions to, to future harm. Um, yeah, that's, I'll stop there. Thanks. Um, Julia, I know you can write books about this, <laughs> your thoughts about it. Yeah. Um, so I can't speak to it in the context of damages cases because that's not my work. I consult on it a little bit, but I don't do it. But in the context of these rights-based cases where the injury piece, the harm piece comes in most often is in the access to justice moment of the case. So it's establishing young people's standing or whoever's bringing the case, their standing um, that they've actually been injured by the defendant, right? That's where we first have to address this issue. And unfortunately today, fortunately for the cases, but unfortunately for the people, it's becoming easier to really make those links between harms, environmental harms, specifically climate in the context of our work and harm to human health and safety and security. Um, so it's actually been the easiest part of our cases is to establish those personal injuries because there are just so many people now who have experienced either the wildfire smoke and their asthmatics and their lives are getting worse um, or their home has been flooded, or they've been evacuated, or, you know, and the climate science is clear enough now about the role of climate change in either causing, exacerbating, making these events more frequent and more likely, you know, all of that is really on solid ground right now. So I think it's just become, unfortunately, much easier to bring these cases with people who are harmed. As you say, um, it helps the lawyers, but that's a terrible state of state of things. Um, we're almost at the end of our time, and I'm wondering if we can just go around. I'd like to just ask one kind of general question of each of you, which is about just the the challenges and the opportunities of working with and on behalf of children, both as as victims and survivors of the the issues that you're talking about, and also as agents um, of change and actors in their own rights. And I'm wondering if we can just sort of go around the room and ask you to talk about sort of what you've learned, if you will, from your experiences of working um, with, uh, with youth and children. Um, maybe we can start with you, Jonathan. Uh, so what I learn over and over again, or what's reinforced over and over again, is young people have a much better vision for what the world can be and should be. Um, so maybe step one is just get out of their way. Um, but I think they're, you know, they're, you know, I've done a lot of work in particularly in recent years, working with young people and um, looking at other people's work and sort of establishing um, pathways for young people to participate meaningfully. There are lots of examples. I mean, there's really at this point, um, very little excuse for not doing it because there are models in all types of organizations from informal consultations and strategies for how to do that in a way that, that really ensures diverse representation among young people and meaningful participation to youth commissions, youth congresses. You know, Growing Up Boulder is an organization in Boulder, Colorado that they can, young people have participated on transportation issues, parks issues, healthcare issues, urban planning issues. That's one of many um, youth congresses, youth commissions. There are cities, many cities have youth commissions. Some are more effective than others. The Guam, as another example, Guam Youth Congress, 
is doing really interesting work. And what's exciting about the way it's structured there is if they, they can write and develop their own bills, and if they pass a bill, that automatically goes to the, the sort of so-called adult, um, ad, you know, grown-up youth uh, congress um, for consideration. So it's a, it's a pathway for directly considering the ideas of young people. Um, and so there are lots of other examples throughout the country, this, uh, this country and across the globe and ways to participate. So um, I think it enriches the work. It's, it, it's challenging, um, but there's something really exciting about a genuine partnership with young people who are excited to have the opportunity to contribute to shaping the world they want to live in. And so, yeah, uh, it, people can email me if they want more examples. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Uh, Ramin? Yeah, um, I don't know. I mean, I, in the in the case that I represented the youth in the in the children's rights convention, I mean, to be honest, I was totally blown away from just by just how passionate um, and articulate and brave, you know, our clients were, um, and just being able to you know, they, they talk to press, they're, they're advocating all the time, um, pushing hard. And I totally agree with Jonathan, like if they were running things, we'd be way better off than, than where we are now. Um, and yeah, I, I just, I think it's so great that they're really driving this, at least in climate change, really driving the, ch the change. And um, it's, it's really wonderful to see. Um, and I just, yeah, I, I've just learned so much from from working with them. Thank you so much. Thanks for that. Julia. Thoughts? Yeah, the first thing Jonathan said I was going to say as well. And so I'll add a couple of other points. Um, young people don't need to be scripted. Their authentic voices are the most powerful thing there is. Um, they need support over their trauma. I mean, they, there's so much trauma. And so when we come in and work with them, we need to be trauma sensitive. And they, they don't want to be our hope. They don't want to be looked at as like, they're here to save us all, right? They want to be partners and, and leaders. And then I think the last thing that I've really learned is how adult-centric the law is and our systems and our world and you know just the language of the law it assumes an adult perspective and so really trying to bring children not just their voices but get it's so hard to get adults to see the child in the story um so i think it's something for all of us to pay attention to thank you samia we'll give you the last word Thanks. Um, and this is, you know, me being youth, my perspective, being involved in these spaces. Um, I think one particular difficulty is accessibility. Um, you know, one aspect of that is definitely language. I think in a lot of these contexts, I have seen um, language be traded off in the interests of continuing an event or a consultation or intervention. Um, I really do think that we can all do better with ensuring that you know, children and youth have access to interpreters um, that it can allow them to participate in these, you know, major decision making, you know, settings, um, just to amplify other youth and especially indigenous youth. I think that's something that can really, you know, use more funding and more thought. Um, another piece of accessibility is just actual, um, you know, information. I think information and um, writing it in a way that is accessible to younger people who may not be so familiar with all of these different, um, you know, international bodies or you know, whatever the case may be. I think it really helps create more meaningful engagement because you can feel, you know, isolated from the process um, just by how things are written. Um, another thing I would flag is definitely impermanence. You know, I really appreciate what Julia mentioned about having youth as partners and less so as, you know, saviors because um there are these positions and consultations you know advisory groups that are for a limited time period and then they dissolve um and so i think one 
great addition that we can do is make sure that youth and children and youth have more permanent, you know, responsibility and involvement in decision making processes. And then the last piece that I'll leave it on is just perspective. I think we are in a time of just a great shift in how we all consider our position in society and the greater world. Um, and I think one thing we can definitely learn from is decolonizing our perspectives about children and youth positions in society. I think indigenous peoples have great frameworks for considering how to respect and engage with children and young people as you know, equal citizens. And so I think that's something that inspires me and I think all of us can um, learn from. I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. Um, I first just want to thank you all for the incredible work that you're doing just to help forge a better future. Um, the time and dedication that you've all devoted to this is, is just extraordinary and the world is grateful to you for this work. So thank you. And in terms of this panel, I just want to thank you for sharing your time and your expertise and your wisdom um, to bring to bear on these issues. Thank you so much. It's just been a fantastic conversation. Um, and I'll turn it back over to you, Martha. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. And um, so I'll just echo uh, Aaron's thanks to the speakers today, uh, Samia, Ramin, Julia, and Jonathan, and to our hardworking moderator, uh, Aaron, who um, really uh, pulled it all together in a really uh, masterful way. So thank you so much. Um, I am going to give you all the last code, but first I have a few things to add here. Um, I want to especially thank our team at Northeastern, Elizabeth Ennen, Jenny Wakefield, Bailey Bickford, Sandy Racinos, uh, Selen Krizet, uh, Siobhan Fanning, and Bradley Whitmarsh, all of whom put in many hours to uh, make this program possible. For those who are looking for more information on uh, these topics on the uh, human right to a healthy environment, we'll soon be completing work on a very comprehensive annotated bibliography on the human right to a healthy environment. We'll circulate that to attendees and post it on our web, web page. Um, I would be happy to receive ideas for future programs to further develop these ideas. So you can email me directly about that, m.davis at northeastern.edu. And uh, I wanna thank everyone for your attention and contributions to the discussion. And so the final code for the New York CLE um, folks is OSVA42. Say it again, OSVA42. And one more time, OSVA42. Someone just asked where we submit the code. You should have received a, 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 a packet that has a, a place to put the codes. If you haven't gotten it yet, just write them down and Jenny Wakefield will be able to supply it uh, to you. Okay, thank you very much for your attention and contributions and uh, goodbye. <laughs>